to the brothers of Heliopolis. Preface. Long considered a chimera, alchemy is increasingly of interest to the scientific world each day. The work of scholars on the constitution of matter, their recent discoveries, prove, beyond doubt, the possibility of dissociating chemical elements. There is no longer any doubt that bodies considered simple are, on the contrary, composed, and the hypothesis of atomic indivisibility finds hardly any supporters. Deceptive inertia disappears from the universe, and what seemed yesterday to be heresy has today become dogma. With an impressive uniformity of action, but to varying degrees, life manifests itself in the three kingdoms of nature, once clearly separated and between which no distinction is made. Origin and vitality are common to the triple group of the ancient classification. Raw substance reveals itself to be animated. Beings and things evolve, progress through constant transformations and renewals. Through the multiplicity of their exchanges and combinations, they move away from the original unity, only to return to their original simplicity under the effect of decompositions. Sublime harmony of the great whole, the immense circle that the spirit travels in its eternal activity, with its center being the unique living particle emanated from the creative word. Thus, after straying from the right path, modern science seeks to regain it, gradually adopting ancient concepts. Like successive civilizations, human progress obeys the undoubted law of perpetual renewal. Against all odds, truth always triumphs, despite its slow, painful, and tortuous progress. Common sense and simplicity eventually prevail over sophisms and prejudices. For there is nothing hidden, teaches the scripture, that shall not be revealed, nor secret that shall not be known, Matthew, X, 26. However, one should not believe that the traditional science whose elements Fulcanelli has gathered in this present work was made accessible to all. The author did not pretend to achieve this. He would greatly deceive himself, even the one who hoped to understand the secret doctrine after a simple reading. Our books are not written for everyone, repeat the old masters, although all are called to read them. Indeed, everyone must make their personal effort, absolutely indispensable if they desire to acquire the notions of a science that has never ceased to be esoteric. That is why the philosophers, in order to conceal its principles from the common people, have covered the ancient knowledge of the mystery of words and the veil of allegories. The ignorant cannot forgive the alchemists for being as faithful to the rigorous discipline they have freely accepted. My master, I know, will not escape the same. Reproach. He had to respect, above all, the divine will, dispenser of light and revelation. He also had to obey the philosophical rule, which imposes on the initiated the necessity of an inviolable secret. In antiquity, especially in Egypt, this primordial submission applied to all branches of sciences and industrial arts. Ceramists, enamelers, goldsmiths, founders, glassmakers worked inside the temples. The labor personnel of the workshops and laboratories were part of the priestly caste and directly reported to the priests. From the medieval period to the 19th century, history offers us many examples of similar organizations in chivalry, monastic orders, Freemasonry, guilds, and companionship. These multiple associations, which jealously guarded the secrets of science or those of the trades, always possessed a mystical or symbolic character, preserved traditional customs, and practiced religious morality. We know how great that the consideration enjoyed by the gentlemen glassmakers, in the presence of monarchs and princes, and to what extent these artists possessed the concern to avoid the dissemination of the secrets specific to the noble glass industry. These exclusive rules have a profound reason. If one were to ask me, I would simply respond that the privilege of science should remain the prerogative of scholars and the elite. When fallen into the popular domain, distributed indiscriminately to the masses, and blindly exploited by them, the most beautiful discoveries prove more harmful than useful. Human nature willingly inclines towards evil and the worst. Most often, what could bring well-being turns to his disadvantage and ultimately becomes the instrument of his ruin. Alas, modern methods of warfare are the most striking and sad proof of this disastrous state of mind. Man is a wolf to man. Because they have employed a language too obscure, it would not be just, in the face of such grave dangers, to bury the memory of our great ancestors under a reproach they do not deserve. Should we condemn and despise them all because they abused reticence? By enveloping their works in silence and surrounding their revelations with parables, the philosophers act wisely. Respectful of social institutions, they harm no one and ensure their own salvation. Allow me, in this regard, a simple anecdote. An admirer of Fulcanelli was conversing one day with one of our best chemists and asked his opinion on metallic transmutation. I believe it is possible, said the scientist, although its realization is highly doubtful. Semicolon and if some sincere witness assured you they had seen it, if they brought you formal proof, replied the friend of the master, what would you think? 
I would think, answered the chemist, that such a man should be relentlessly hunted down and eliminated as a dangerous criminal. From then on, prudence, extreme caution, and absolute discretion prevailed. The prudence, extreme caution, and absolute discretion appear fully justified. Who, after that, would blame the adepts for the particular style they employed in their disclosures? Who would dare cast the first stone at the author of this book? But one should not conclude that there is nothing to discover in the works of the philosophers because clear language may seem forbidden. Quite the contrary, it only requires a little sagacity to know how to read them and understand their essence. Among ancient authors and modern writers, Fulcanelli is undoubtedly one of the most sincere and convincing. He establishes the hermetic theory on solid foundations, supports it with obvious analogical facts, and then presents it in a simple and precise manner. To discover on what the principles of the art rest, thanks to clear and firm development, the student has only a few efforts to make. It will even be possible for him to accumulate a great deal of necessary knowledge. Provided in this way, he can then undertake his great labor and leave the speculative domain for that of positive achievements. From that moment on, he will see the first difficulties arise before him, many almost insurmountable obstacles emerge. There is no researcher who does not know these stumbling blocks, these impassable milestones, against which I have, several times, almost broken myself. And of this, more than myself, my master retains the indelible memory. Following the example of Basile Valentin, his true initiator, he was held in check, unable to find a way out, for more than 30 years. Fulcanelli has pushed the detail of the practice much further than anyone else, with an intention of charity towards the workers, his brothers, and to help them overcome these tiresome causes of stops. His method is different from that used by his predecessors. It consists of describing in detail all the operations of the work, after having divided them into several fragments. He thus takes each phase of the work, begins the explanation in one chapter, interrupts it to continue in another, and finishes it in a final place. This piecemeal approach. Such is the capital interest of the book that Fulcanelli presents to the cultured reader, called upon to judge the work according to its value, according to its originality, or perhaps to estimate it according to its merit. Finally, it would seem to me that I have not said everything if I omitted to mention the remarkable and splendid drawings of the painter Julian Champagne. The excellent artist deserves here also the highest praise. I am also happy to express my heartfelt thanks to the publisher, Mr. Gene Schemet, whose very sure taste and proven competence have so perfectly directed the construction of the material part of the philosopher's dwellings. Eugène Cancellet. Philosophical Dwellings, Dwellings of the Philosophers. Book 1. History and Monument. Paradoxical in its manifestations, disconcerting in its signs, the Middle Ages proposes to the sagacity of its admirers the resolution of a singular misunderstanding. How to reconcile the irreconcilable. How to reconcile the testimony of historical facts with that of medieval works. The chroniclers depict this unfortunate era in the darkest colors. For several centuries, there were only invasions, wars, famines, epidemics, and yet the monuments, faithful and sincere witnesses of these nebulous times, bear no trace of such scourges. On the contrary, they seem to have been built in the enthusiasm of a powerful inspiration of idealism and faith, by a people happy to live, within a flourishing and strongly organized society. Should we doubt the truthfulness of historical accounts, the authenticity of the events they report, and believe, with the wisdom of nations, that happy peoples have no history? Unless, without rejecting all of history outright, one prefers to discover, in a relative absence of incidents, the justification of medieval obscurity. Be that as it may, what remains undeniable is that all Gothic buildings without exception reflect a serenity, an expansiveness, a nobility without equal. If one examines closely the expression of statuary in particular, one will quickly be enlightened about the peaceful character, the pure tranquility emanating from its figures. All are calm and smiling, friendly and benevolent, stone humanity, silent and good company. Women have that plumpness which sufficiently indicates, in their models, the excellence of a rich and substantial diet. Children are chubby, satisfied, flourishing. Priests, deacons, capuchins, provisioning brothers, clerics, and cantors sport a jovial face or the pleasing silhouette of their portly dignity. Their interpreters, those marvelous and modest image cutters, do not deceive us and cannot deceive themselves. They take their types from every day. Life, among the people who bustle around them and amidst whom they themselves live. Many of these figures, picked at random from the alley, the tavern, or the school, from the sacristy or the workshop, may perhaps be overloaded or overly accentuated, but in the picturesque note, with the concern for character, the cheerful sense, the broad form. Grotesque, 
if you will, but joyful and instructive grotesques, satires of people who love to laugh, drink, sing, and live it up, masterpieces of a realistic school, profoundly human and confident in its mastery, conscious of its means, yet ignorant of pain, misery, oppression, or slavery. This is so true that you may search and interrogate Ogilvy's statuary in vain, you will never discover a figure of Christ whose expression reveals real suffering. You will agree with us that the stonecutters have taken enormous trouble to gild their crucified ones with a gray physiognomy without always succeeding. The best of them, barely emaciated, have closed eyelids and seem to be at rest. On our cathedrals, the scenes of the Last Judgment show grimacing, distorted, monstrous demons, more comic than terrible. As for the damned, cursed and anesthetized, they simmer gently in their cauldron, without vain regret or genuine pain. These free, virile, and healthy images prove beyond doubt that the artists of the Middle Ages were unaware of the depressing spectacle of human misery. If the people had suffered, if the masses had groaned in misfortune, the monuments would have kept the memory alive. Now, we know that art, this superior expression of civilized humanity, can only develop freely in the favor of stable and secure peace. Just as science, art cannot exercise its genius in the atmosphere of troubled societies. All elevated manifestations of human thought are there. Revolutions, wars, upheavals are fatal to them. They require the security arising from order and concord, in order to grow, flourish, and bear fruit. Strong reasons urge us to accept with circumspection the medieval events reported by history. And we confess that the assertion of a series of calamities, disasters, of accumulated ruins during 146 years seems truly excessive. There is an inexplicable anomaly here, since it is precisely during this unfortunate Hundred Years' War, which extends from the year 1337 to the year 1453, that the richest buildings of our flamboyant style were constructed. It is the pinnacle, the culmination of form and boldness, the marvelous phase where the spirit, divine flame, imposes its signature on the last creations of the penultimate era. It is the time of completion of the great basilicas, but other important monuments of religious architecture are also being erected, collegiate or abbey churches, such as the abbeys of Salem, Cluny, Saint Riquier, the Chartreuse of Dijon, Saint Wolfran of Aville, Saint Etienne of Beauvais, etc. Remarkable civil buildings emerge from the ground, from the Hospice of Bone to the Palais de Justice of Rouen and the Town Hall of Compiègne, from the mansions built everywhere by Jacques Coeur, to the belfries of the free cities, Béthun, Douai, Dunkirk, etc. In our big cities, narrow alleys carve their way under the accumulation of jutting gables, turrets and balconies, houses of carved wood, stone lodgings with delicately adorned facades, and everywhere, under the protection of the guilds, trades flourish, everywhere companions compete in skill, everywhere mutual emulation produces masterpieces. The university instills lofty ideas, and its renown extends throughout the old world. Famous doctors, illustrious scholars spread, propagate the benefits of science and philosophy, spagiris a mass, in the silence of the laboratory, the materials that will later serve as the basis for our chemistry. Great adepts give hermetic truth a new impetus. What art are displayed in all branches of human activity? And what richness, what fecundity, what power, what confidence in the future shine through this desire to build, to create, to seek and discover in the midst of invasion, in this wretched land of France subjected to foreign domination, and which knows all the horrors of an endless war? Truly, we do not understand. Hence, one will understand why our preference remains with the Middle Ages, as revealed to us by Gothic buildings, rather than with the same period as described by historians. For it is easy to fabricate texts and documents from scratch, old charters with patinated charades, parchments and seals with an archaic appearance, or even some sumptuous book of hours, annotated in its margins, bleedingly illuminated with locks, borders, and miniatures. Montmartre offers to whoever desires it, and according to the price offered, the Rembrandt, unknown or the authentic tenure, a skilled artisan from the all-district shapes, with stunning verve and mastery, small Egyptian heads of gold and solid bronze, wonders of imitations coveted by some antiquarians. Who does not remember the famous Sture, so famous, of Cytoferns? Falsification, counterfeiting are as old as the world, and history, abhorring chronological voids, has sometimes had to call upon them for help. A very learned Jesuit of the 17th century, Father Jean Ardouin, did not hesitate to denounce as apocryphal a quantity of Greek and Roman coins and medals, struck during the Renaissance, buried in order to fill in large historical gaps. Anatole de Montaiglon informs us that Jacques Debye published, in 1639, a folio volume accompanied by plates and entitled, Les Familles de France, 
illustrated by monuments of ancient and modern metals, which, he says, has more invented metals than real ones. Let us agree that, to provide history with the documentation it lacked, Jacques de B used a faster and more economical method than that denounced by Father Ardouin. Victor Hugo, citing the four most reputable histories of France around 1830, those of Dupix, Missouri, Veli, and Father Daniel says of the latter that the author, famous Jesuit, only relies on his own authority to produce in 20 years a history where the only merit is erudition, and in which Count de Boulinvilliers found hardly more than 10,000 errors. It is known that Caligula, erected, in the year 40, near Boulogne-sur-Mer, the Tower of Order, to deceive future generations about a supposed descent of Caligula in Great Britain, converted into a lighthouse, Tourist Ardennes, by one of his successors, the Tower of Order collapsed in 1645. What historian will provide us with the reason, superficial or profound, invoked by the sovereigns of England to justify the quality and title of kings of France that they retained until the 18th century? And yet, the English currency of that time still bears the imprint of such pretension. Formerly, on the school benches, we were taught that the first French king was named Faramond, and the year 420 was set as the date of his accession. Today, the royal genealogy begins with Clodion the Harry, because it has been recognized that his father, Faramond, never reigned. But, in those distant times of the 5th century, are we really certain of the authenticity of the documents relating to the deeds and actions of Clodion? Will these not be disputed someday, before being relegated to the realm of legends and fables? For Hausmanns, history is the most solemn of lies and the most childish of illusions. Events, he says, are, for a talented man, nothing but a springboard of ideas and style, since all blend or worsen, according to the needs of a cause or the temperament of the writer who handles them. As for the documents that support them, it is even worse, for none of them is irreducible, and all are revisable. If they are not apocryphal, others, no less certain, are unearthed later that controvert them waiting for themselves to be demonetized by the exhumation of no less reliable archives. The tombs of historical figures are also sources of information subject to controversy. We have observed this more than once. The inhabitants of Bergamo experienced, in 1922, an equally unpleasant surprise. Could they believe that their local celebrity, the fiery condottier Bartolomeo Coleoni who filled the Italian annals of the 15th century with his warlike whims, was nothing but a legendary shadow? Now, on a doubt of the king visiting Bergamo, the municipality had the mausoleum adorned with the famous equestrian statue moved, opened the tomb, and all the attendees observed, not without astonishment, that it was empty. In France, at least, such flippancy is not taken so far. Authentic or not, our sepulchres contain bones. Amade de Pintu recounts that the sarcophagus of François Myron, a Parisian magistrate of 1604, was found during the demolition of the house at number 13 Rue d'Arcolet, immovable erected on the foundations of the St. Marine Church, in which he had been buried. The lead coffin, writes the author, in which he had been interred, is perfectly erased, when formed of a strangled ellipse. The epitaph is completely erased. When the coffin lid was lifted, only a skeleton surrounded by a blackish soot, a mixture of dust. Strangely, neither the insignia of his office, nor his sword, nor his ring, etc., nor even traces of his coat of arms were found. However, the Commission of Fine Arts, through its experts, declared that it was indeed the great Parisian ancestor, and these illustrious relics were descended into the vaults of Notre Dame. A testimony of similar value is reported by Fernand Bornin in his work Paris Atlas. We speak to each other only as a reminder, he says, of the house located on K.O. Floor, where it bears the numbers 9 to 11, and where an inscription, without the slightest hint of authenticity or even plausibility, designates it as the famous abode of Eloise and Avalar in 1118, rebuilt in 1849. Such assertions engraved in marble defy common sense. Let us hasten to recognize that, in its historical distortions, Father Lorike asserts less boldness. In historical distortions, Father Lorike asserts less boldness in presenting a true alternative course of instruction intended to clarify what we are willing to think. It is a very tenacious prejudice that for a long time attributed the invention of the wheelbarrow to the learned Pascal. And, although the falsity of this attribution is now demonstrated, it nonetheless remains that the vast majority of people persist in believing it to be true. Ask a schoolchild, and they will tell you that this practical vehicle, known to all, owes its conception to the illustrious physicist. Among the mischievous, boisterous, and often distracted personalities of the small school population, it is especially this alleged achievement that imposes the name of Pascal on young minds. Indeed, 
many primary school students, ignorant of who Descartes, Michelangelo, Dennis Papon, or Torricelli were, will not hesitate for a second about Pascal. It would be interesting to know why our children, among so many admirable discoveries whose daily application they witness, know more about Pascal and his wheelbarrow than the geniuses to whom we owe steam, the electric battery, beet sugar, and stearic candles. Is it because the wheelbarrow touches them more closely, interests them more, is more familiar to them, perhaps? Nevertheless, the common error propagated by elementary history books could have been easily unmasked. It was simply enough to leaf through some illuminated manuscripts from the 13th and 14th centuries, several of which contain miniatures depicting medieval farmers using the wheelbarrow. Likewise, without undertaking such delicate research, a glance at the monuments would have allowed the truth to be restored. Among the motifs decorating an archival to the northern porch of Beauvais Cathedral, for example, an old rustic from the 15th century is depicted pushing his wheelbarrow, a wheelbarrow of a model similar to those we currently use. The same utensil is also noticeable in agricultural scenes forming the subject of sculpted holy misery cords, originating from the stalls of the Abbey of St. Lucien, near Beauvais, 1492-1500. Moreover, if the truth compels us to deny Pascal the benefit of a very ancient invention, dating back several centuries before his birth, it cannot diminish in any way the greatness and power of his genius. The immortal author of the Pensee, a probability calculus, the inventor of the hydraulic press, the calculating machine, etc., commands our admiration for works and discoveries of a magnitude greater than that of the wheelbarrow. But what is important to emphasize, what matters only to us, is that in the pursuit of truth, it is preferable to appeal to the edifice rather than to historical accounts, sometimes incomplete, often biased, almost always subject to doubt. It is to a parallel conclusion that Mr. André Geiger arrives when, struck by the inexplicable homage paid by Hadrian to the statue of Nero, he dispenses justice against the unjust accusations made against this emperor and against Tiberius. Like us, he refuses all credence to historical reports, deliberately falsified, concerning these so-called human monsters, and does not hesitate to write, I trust more in the monuments and logic than in the histories. If, as we have said, the manipulation of a text, the writing of a chronicle require only a little skill and know-how, on the other hand, it is impossible to build a cathedral. Let us therefore turn to the edifices, they will provide us with more serious, better indications. There, at least, we will see our characters portrayed to the life, fixed in stone or wood, with their real physiognomy, their costume and gestures, whether they appear in sacred scenes or compose secular subjects. We will engage with them and soon come to love them. Sometimes we will question the 13th century reaper, sharpening his scythe at the portal of Paris, sometimes the 15th century apothecary, who, at the stalls of Amiens, pounds some unknown drug in his wooden mortar. His neighbor, the drunkard with the florid nose, is not a stranger to us. We remember having met this cheerful drinker several times, in the course of our wanderings. Could he not be the man who exclaimed, in the midst of the mystery, at the sight of the miracle of Jesus at the wedding at Cana, if I knew how to do what he does, the entire sea of Galilee would be turned into wine, and never on earth would there be a drop of water, nor would it rain anything from the sky that was not wine. And this beggar, escaped from the court of miracles, with no other sign of distress than his rags and lice, we also recognize him. It is he whom the confrere de la passion stage at the feet of Christ, and who, lamentable, utters this soliloquy. I look upon my flags, hoping to find some coin there, I hear soon after. Give him, give him, there is not a penny, not even half. A poor man has no friend. Despite all that has been written, we must, willingly or unwillingly, accustom ourselves to the truth that at the beginning of the Middle Ages society was already rising to a higher degree of civilization and splendor. Jean de Salisbury, who visited Paris in 1176, expresses in his Polycriticon the most sincere enthusiasm on this subject. When I saw, he said, the abundance of provisions, the cheerfulness of the people, the good conduct of the clergy, the majesty and glory of the whole church, the various occupations of men admitted to the study of philosophy, it seemed to me that I saw that Jacob's ladder, whose top reached to heaven and where the angels ascended and descended. I was forced to admit that, truly, the Lord was in this place and that I was unaware of it. This passage from a poet also came to mind. Blessed is he to whom this place is assigned for exile. Chapter 2 Middle Ages and Renaissance No one disputes, at the present time, the high value of medieval works, but who will ever be able to reason the strange contempt with which they were treated until the 19th century? Who will tell us why, since the Renaissance, 
the elite of artists, scholars, and thinkers made a point of affecting the most complete indifference towards the bold creations of a misunderstood era, which was the epitome of originality and so magnificently expressive of French genius. What was, what could have been the root cause of the reversal of opinion, and then the banishment, the exclusion that weighed for so long on Gothic art? Should we blame ignorance, caprice, the perversion of taste? We do not know. A French writer, Charles de Ray Massa, one believes he discovers the primary reason for this unjust disdain in the absence of literature, which is surprising. The Renaissance, he assures us, despised the Middle Ages because true French literature, which succeeded it, erased its last traces. And yet, the France of the Middle Ages offers a striking spectacle. Its genius was lofty and severe. It delighted in serious meditations, in profound research. It set forth, in a language without grace or brilliance, sublime truths and subtle hypotheses. It produced a remarkably philosophical literature. Undoubtedly, this literature has influenced the human mind more than it has served it. In vain have men of the highest caliber successively illuminated it. For modern generations, their works are as if they had never existed. It is because they have the spirit and ideas, but not the talent to express them well, in a language that does not lend itself. Scotus Origina, at certain moments, recalls Plato, few have pushed philosophical freedom further than him, and he boldly rises into that region of the clouds where truth shines only sporadically, he thought for himself in the 11th century. Saint Anselm is an original metaphysician whose scholarly idealism rejuvenates common beliefs, and he conceived and realized the audacious idea of directly grasping the notion of divinity. He is the theologian of pure reason. Saint Bernard is sometimes brilliant and ingenious, sometimes grave and moving. Mystical like Fenelon, he resembles an acting and popular Bossuet, who dominates the age by his words and commands kings instead of praising and serving them. His sad rival, his noble victim, Abelard, brought into the exposition of dialectical science an unknown rigor and a relative lucidity, which attest to a nervous and flexible spirit, capable of understanding and explaining everything. He is a great propagator of ideas. Eloise forced a dry and pedantic language to convey the delicacies of an elite intelligence, the pains of the proudest and most tender soul, the transports of a desperate passion. Jean de Salisbury is a discerning critic to whom the human mind presents itself as a spectacle, and he describes it in its progress, its movements, its returns, with a truth and a premature impartiality. He seems to have guessed this talent of our time, this art of making the intellectual society pose before oneself to judge it. St. Thomas, embracing at once all the philosophy of his time, sometimes anticipated that of ours. He linked all human knowledge in a perpetual syllogism and unwound it entirely along the thread of continuous reasoning, thus realizing the union of a vast mind and a logical mind. Gerson, finally, a theologian whom sentiment contends with deduction, who began a neglected philosophy, knew how to submit reason without humiliating it, captivate hearts without offending minds, finally imitating the God who makes himself believed by making himself loved. All these men, and I do not name all their equals, were great in their works admirable. To be admired, to retain a constant influence on subsequent literature, what did they lack? It was neither science, nor thought, nor genius. I am afraid it was only one thing, style. French literature does not come from them. It does not claim their authority, it does not adorn itself with their names, it is only boasted of effacing them. From which we can conclude that if the Middle Ages had the spirit, the Renaissance took a mischievous pleasure in imprisoning us in the letter. What Charles de Ramassa says is very judicious, at least concerning the early medieval period, the one where intellectualism appears to be subject to Byzantine influence and still imbued with Romanesque doctrines. A century later, the same reasoning loses much of its value. One cannot contest, for example, the works of the cycle of the round table, a certain charm emanating from a more refined form already. Thibault, Count of Champagne, in his Songs of the King of Navarre, Guillaume de Lurie and Jehan Clopinel, authors of the Romance of the Rose, all are true veers and troubadours of the 13th and 14th centuries, without having the haughty genius of their philosopher ancestors, the medieval thought reveals itself to be of a scientific essence and nothing else. Art and literature are only humble servants of traditional science for it. They have the express mission of symbolically translating the truths that the Middle Ages received from antiquity and of which it remained the faithful custodian. Subjected to purely allegorical expression, held under the imperative will of the same parable that withholds from the profane the Christian mystery, art and literature show evident discomfort and display some stiffness, but the solidity and simplicity of their craftsmanship contribute nonetheless to endowing them with undeniable originality. Certainly, the observer will never find the image of Christ presented to us by Romanesque porches appealing, where Jesus, at the center of the mystical amaranth, 
appears surrounded by the four evangelistic animals. It suffices for us that his divinity be emphasized by his own emblems and thus announce itself as revealing a secret teaching. We admire Gothic masterpieces for their nobility and the boldness of their expression. If they do not possess the idyllic perfection of form, they possess to the highest degree the initiatory power of a learned and transcendent philosophy. They are serious and austere productions, not light motifs, graceful, pleasant, like those that art, since the Renaissance, has delighted in lavishing on us. But while the latter only aspires to flatter the eye or charm the senses, the artistic and literary works of the Middle Ages are supported by a superior, true, and concrete thought, the cornerstone of an immutable science, the indestructible foundation of religion. If we were to define these two tendencies, one deep, the other superficial, we would say that Gothic art is held entirely in the learned majesty of its buildings and the Renaissance and the pleasant adornment of its lodgings. The medieval colossus did not collapse in one fell swoop at the decline of the 15th century. In many places, its genius managed to resist the imposition of new directives for a long time. We see its agony prolonged until around the middle of the following century and find, in some buildings of this period, the philosophical impetus, the foundation of wisdom that generated so many works for three centuries. Are we also to find fault with their recent construction? But let us pause on these lesser works, yet of similar significance, with the hope of recognizing therein the secret, symbolically expressed idea of their creators. These refuges of ancient esotericism, these asylums of traditional science, now exceedingly rare, are what, regardless of their purpose or utility, we classify in hermetic iconology, among the artistic guardians of high philosophical truths. Desiring an example, here is the admirable tympanum that adorned, in the distant 12th century, the entrance door of an old house in Reims, the subject, quite transparent, easily dispensed with description. Under a large arch flanked by two other twin arches, a master teaches his disciple and points with his finger to the passage he is commenting on in the pages of an open book. Below, a young and vigorous athlete strangles a monstrous animal, perhaps a dragon, of which only the head and neck are visible. He is accompanied by two youths tightly embraced. Thus, science appears as the dominator of strength and love, opposing the superiority of the mind to the physical manifestations of power and sentiment. How can we admit that a construction bearing such a thought did not belong to some unknown philosopher? Why should we deny this bar leaf the credit of a symbolic conception emanating from a cultivated mind, from an educated man affirming his taste for study and setting an example? We would, therefore, be greatly mistaken to exclude from dwelling the so characteristic frontispiece, from among the emblematic works that we propose to study under the general title of philosophical dwellings. Chapter 3. Medieval Alchemy of all the sciences cultivated in the Middle Ages, none, certainly, had more popularity and honor than the science. I. This tympanum is preserved at the Lapidaire Museum of Reims, established in the premises of the Civil Hospital, former Abbey of St. Remy, Rue Simon. It was discovered around 1857, during the construction of the prison, in the foundations of the house known as the Cretan de Reims, located on the Parvis Square, and which bore the inscription, Fides, Spes, Caritas. This house belonged to the chapter alchemical, such as the name under which the sacred or priestly art, inherited from the Egyptians by the Arabs, was concealed and subsequently embraced with such enthusiasm by medieval Westerners. Many controversies have arisen regarding the various etymologies attributed to the word alchemy. Pierre-Jean Fabre, in his Abrégé des Secrets Chimiques, suggests that it recalls the name of Cham, son of Noah, who is said to have been its first artisan, and writes it as alchemy. An anonymous author of a curious manuscript believes that the word alchemy is derived from ales, which means salt in Greek, and chymia, which means fusion, and thus it is well said, because the salt, which is so admirable, is employed. But if salt is called hals in the Greek language, chymia, here put for chymia, alchemy, has no other meaning than that of juice or humor. Others find its origin in the first denomination of the land of Egypt, the homeland of the sacred art, chymi or chemi. Napoleon Landais finds no difference between the two words chymi and alchemy. He only adds that the prefix al cannot be confused with the Arabic article and simply signifies a marvelous virtue. Those who argue the opposite by using the article al and the noun shimi intend to designate the chemistry par excellence or hyperchemistry of modern occultists. If we were to offer our personal opinion in this debate, we would say that phonetic cabal recognizes a close relationship between the Greek words chymia, chymia, and chemos, which indicates that which flows, trickles, flows, thus particularly marks molten metal, the fusion itself, as well as any work made of molten metal. 
This would be a brief and succinct definition of alchemy as a metallurgical technique. But we know, on the other hand, that the name and the thing are based on the permutation of form by light, fire, or spirit. At least, this is the true meaning indicated by the language of birds. Born in the Orient, homeland of mystery and marvel, the science of alchemy spread to the West through three major channels of penetration, Byzantine, Mediterranean, and Hispanic. It was primarily the result of Arab conquests. This curious, studious, philosophy and culture-loving people, the quintessential civilizing nation, formed the link, the chain that connects ancient Eastern civilization to the Middle Ages. Occidental, indeed, in the history of human progress, they play a role comparable to that of the Phoenician merchants between Egypt and Assyria. The Arabs, educators of the Greeks and Persians, transmitted to Europe the science of Egypt and Babylon, augmented by their own acquisitions, across the European continent, Byzantine route, around the 8th century AD. On the other hand, Arab influence exerted its influence in our regions upon the return of expeditions from Palestine, Mediterranean route, and it was the crusaders of the 12th century who brought in most of the ancient knowledge. Finally, closer to us, at the dawn of the 13th century, truly increases its followers and gradually spreads in consciousness and love of this science. Alchemy took root in Europe on its own and soon asserts itself. It tends to impose itself, and this exotic, transplanted into our soil, acclimatizes wonderfully, develops with such vigor that it soon blossoms into exuberant flowering. Its expansion, its progress, are prodigious. It was scarcely cultivated, and only in the shadow of monastic cells, in the 11th century, by the 14th century, it had spread everywhere, shining brightly in all social classes where it shines most brightly. Every country offers a nursery of fervent disciples to the mysterious science, and every condition hastens to sacrifice to it. Nobility, high bourgeoisie, indulge in it. Scholars, monks, princes, prelates make it their profession. Even craftsmen and small artisans, goldsmiths, glassblowers, enamelers, apothecaries, feel the irresistible desire to handle the retort. If it is not worked on openly, royal authority pursues the blowers and pagans fulminate against them one. Yet it is studied under cover. The company of philosophers, true or pretentious, is eagerly sought after. Some undertake long journeys with the intention of increasing their store of knowledge, or correspond, through cipher, from country to country, from kingdom to kingdom. The manuscripts of the great adepts, those of the Panapolitan Zosimos, of Austanes, of Synesius, the copies of Gaber, Razus, Artifius are fiercely sought after. The books of Morian, of Mary the prophetess, the fragments of Hermes are negotiated at great prices. The fever seizes the intellectuals, and with the fraternities, lodges, and initiatory centers, the blowers grow and multiply. Few families escape the pernicious attraction of the golden chimera, they are very rare. Those that do not include within their midst some practicing alchemist, some hunter of the impossible. Imagination runs wild. The Avari Sacra fames ruins the noble, despairs the commoner, sometimes deceives and benefits only the charlatan. Abbots, bishops, doctors, hermits, writes Longlet to Fresnoy, all made it their occupation. It was the folly of the time, and it is known that each century has its own. But unfortunately, this one has reigned longer than the others and is not even entirely past. With what passion, what breath, what hopes the cursed science envelops the Gothic cities asleep under the stars, underground and secret fermentation which, as soon as night falls, fills the deep cellars with strange pulsations, exhales from the basement windows in intermittent lights, rises in sulfurous spirals to the tops of the pigeons. After the famous name of Artifius, around 1130, the renown of the masters who succeed him confirms the hermetic reality and stimulates the ardor of the adepts' aspirants. In the 13th century, there is the illustrious English monk Roger Bacon, whom his disciples nicknamed Dr. Admirabilis, 1214-1292, and whose enormous reputation becomes universal. France follows with Alain de Lille, doctor of Paris and monk of Citeaux, died around 1298, Christophe Le Parisien, around 1260, and Master Arnaud de Villeneuve, 1245-1310, while shining in Italy are Thomas Aquinas, Dr. Angelicus, 1225, and the monk Ferrari, 1280. The 14th century sees the emergence of a whole host of artists. Raymond Lowell, Dr. Illuminatus, Spanish Franciscan monk, 1235 to 1315. John Daston, English philosopher. John Creamer, abbot of Westminster. Richard, known as Robert the Englishman, author of the Correctorium Alchemiae, around 1330. 
the Italian Pietro Buono of Lombardy, the French Pope John XXII, 1244 to 1317, Guillaume de Paris, instigator of the hermetic bar reliefs of the porch of Notre Dame, Jean de Mun, called Clopinal, one of the authors of the Roman de la Rose, 1280 to 1364, Grassus, known as Hortulanus, commentator on the Emerald Tablet, 1358. Finally, the most famous and popular philosopher of our country, the alchemist Nicolas Flamel, 1330 to 1417. The 15th century marks the glorious period of science and surpasses even the preceding ones, both in value and in the number of masters who have illustrated it. Among these, it is appropriate to mention in the first rank Basil Valentine, Benedictine monk of the Abbey of Saint-Pierre, in Air Fort, electorate of Mainz, around 1413, the most esteemed artist. Perhaps the most remarkable that Hermetic art has ever produced, his compatriot, Abbot Trithemius, Isaac the Dutchman, 1408, the two Englishmen Thomas Norton and George Ripley, Lambsbrink, George Aurock, from Strasbourg, 1415, the Calabrian monk Lassigny, 1459, and the noble Bernard Trevisan, 1406-1490, who devoted 56 years of his life to the pursuit of the work, and whose name will remain in alchemical history as a symbol of stubbornness, constancy, and irreducible perseverance. From this moment on, Hermetism falls into discredit. Even its own supporters, embittered by failure, turn against it. Attacked from all sides, its prestige disappears. Enthusiasm wanes, opinion changes. Practical operations, collected, gathered, then revealed and taught, allow dissidents to support the thesis of alchemical nothingness, to ruin philosophy by laying the foundations of our chemistry. Sethen, Vinsla's Labanus de Moravia, Zachair, Paracelsus R., in the 16th century, the only known heirs of Egyptian esotericism, which the Renaissance rejected after corrupting it. Let us render, in passing, a supreme homage to the ardent defender of ancient truths that Paracelsus was, the great tribune deserves from us eternal gratitude for his final and courageous intervention. Although vain, it nonetheless constitutes one of his fine titles of glory. Hermetic art prolongs its agony until the 17th century and finally dies out, not without giving the Western world three offspring of great stature, Lascaris, President Despagnet, and the mysterious Irony Philolethes, the pre-enigma whose true personality could never be discovered. For the legendary laboratory, with its procession of mystery and the unknown, under its veil of illuminism and wonder, alchemy evokes a whole past of distant stories, wondrous tales, surprising testimonies. Its singular theories, its strange recipes, the secular renown of its grand masters, the passionate controversies it aroused, the favor it enjoyed in the Middle Ages, its obscure, enigmatic, paradoxical literature, seem to us today to emit the smell of musty dampness, of rarefied air acquired, in the long contact of the years, by empty tombs, dead flowers, abandoned dwellings, yellowed parchments. The alchemist, semicolon a meditative old man, with a serious and crowned forehead of white hair, a pale and ravaged silhouette, an original figure of a vanished humanity and a forgotten world, a stubborn recluse, devoted to study, vigilance, persevering research, and the stubborn deciphering of the mysteries of high science. Such is the philosopher that the poet's imagination and the artist's brush have delighted in representing to us. His laboratory, cave, cell, or ancient crypt, is barely lit by a sad daylight, still diffused by the multiple cobwebs of dusty spiders. Yet it is there, in the midst of silence, that the prodigy gradually takes place. Unassailable nature, better than in its rocky abysses, labors under the prudent safeguard of man, with the help of the stars and by the grace of God. Occult labor, thankless encyclopedian task, of a nightmare's magnitude, in the center of this in pace, a being, a scientist for whom nothing else exists anymore, attentively and patiently monitors the successive phases of the great work. As our eyes become accustomed, a thousand things emerge from the darkness, arise and become clearer. Where are we, Lord? Could it be in the cave of Polyphemus or in Vulcan's cave? Near us, an extinguished forge, covered with dust and hammer marks, the anvil, the hammer, the tongs, the forces, the grips, rusted ingot molds, the rough and powerful tools of the metallurgist have come to rest there. In a corner, large books heavily bound, like antiphonaries, with lead-sealed seals, dressed in ashy manuscripts, grimoires overlaid with jumbled masses, tawny volumes, riddled with notes and formulas, stained from the beginning to the end. Flasks, swollen like good monks, filled with opalescent emulsions, glaucus, eugenus, or incarnadine liquids, 
Exhale those acidic fumes whose sharpness tightens the throat and pricks the nostrils. On the hood of the furnace, curious oblong vessels are aligned, with short pipes, stuffed and capped with wax, matrasses, with iridescent spheres of metallic deposits, stretch their necks sometimes slender and cylindrical, sometimes flared or swollen. The greenish retorts, alembics, and pottery cucurbits are juxtaposed with crucibles of reddish and flaming earth. At the bottom, placed on their pans along a stone cornice, philosophical eggs, hyaline and elegant, contrast with the massive and rounded gourd, pregnans cucurbita, a rounded alembic or retort. Damnation. Here are now anatomical pieces, skeletal fragments, blackened skulls, toothless, repugnant in their grimace of the grave, suspended human fetuses, dried, shriveled, miserable remnants offering their tiny bodies to the gaze, their parchment-like, grinning, and pitiful heads. Those round, glassy eyes, and gilded are those of an owl with faded plumage, which neighbors the alligator, giant salamander, another important symbol of the practice. The hideous reptile emerges from a dark recess, stretches the chain of its vertebrae on its stout legs, and directs towards the arches the bony abyss of formidable jaws. Placed without order, at the mercy of needs, on the furnace's soul, see these vitrified pots, aludals or sublimatories, these pelicans with thick walls, these howls resembling large eggs, one of which would reveal one of the shilazi, these olivaceous bosses buried deep in the sand, against the athenor with its light fumes climbing the ogival vault. Here, the copper alembic, homo galatus, helmeted man, stained with green smudges. There, the descensoirs, the concurbits and their antennae, the twin brothers or cohabitation twins. Coiled vessels, heavy mortars of cast iron and marble, a large bellows with wrinkled leather sides, near a pile of mittens, tiles, bowls, evaporators. Chaotic heap of archaic instruments, bizarre materials, outdated utensils, mishmash of all sciences, clutter of impressive faunas, and, hovering over this disorder, fixed to the keystone, pendant with wings outspread, the great raven, hieroglyph of material death and its decompositions, mysterious emblem of mysterious operations. The wall is curious too, or at least what remains of it. Mystical inscriptions fill its voids, hic lapis es subtis te, super te, erga te et circa te, in English as, this stone is below you, above you, around you, and within you, mnemonic verses intertwined there, engraved at the whim of the stylus on the soft stone, one of them predominates, carved in Gothic cursive, as oft that ignis t be sufficient, in English that is, as often fire suffice for you, Hebrew characters, circles intersected by triangles, intertwined with quadrilaterals in the manner of Gnostic signatures. Here, a thought, based on the dogma of unity, summarizes the entire philosophy, omnia ab uno et in unum omnia, or in English as all from one, and in one, all. Elsewhere, the image of the scythe, emblem of the thirteenth arcane and the Saturnine house, Solomon's star, the symbol of the crab, an abjuration of evil spirits, some passages of Zoroaster, testimonies of the ancientness of cursed sciences. Finally, situated in the luminous field of the ventilator, and more legible in this maze of uncertainties, the hermetic term, salt, sulfur, mercury, and gilded are those of a faded feathered owl, which neighbors the alligator, giant salamander, another important symbol of the practice. The hideous reptile emerges from a dark recess, stretches the chain of its vertebrae on its stout legs and directs towards the arches the bony abyss of formidable jaws. Placed without order, at the mercy of needs, on the sole of the furnace, see these vitrified pots, aludals or sublimatories, these pelicans with thick walls, these hells resembling large eggs, one of which would reveal one of the chalazes, these olivaceous bosses buried deep in the sand, against the athenor with its light fumes climbing the ogival vault. Here, the copper alembic, helmeted man, stained with green smudges, there, the descensoirs, the concurbits and their antennae, the two brothers or cohabitation twins, coiled vessels, heavy mortars of cast iron and marble, a large bellows with wrinkled leather sides, near a pile of mittens, tiles, bowls, evaporators, chaotic heap of archaic instruments, bizarre materials, outdated utensils, mishmash of all sciences, clutter of impressive faunas, and, hovering over this disorder, fixed to the keystone, pendant with wings outspread, the great raven, hieroglyph of material death and its decompositions, mysterious emblem of mysterious operations. Also curious is the wall, or at least what remains of it, mystical inscriptions fill its voids, this stone is below you, above you, around you, and within you, mnemonic verses intertwine there, engraved at the whim of the stylus on the soft stone, one of them predominates, 
carved in Gothic cursive, as often fire suffice for you. Hebrew characters, circles intersected by triangles, intertwined with quadrilaterals in the manner of Gnostic signatures. Here, a thought, based on the dogma of unity, summarizes the entire philosophy, all from one, and in one, all. Elsewhere, the image of the scythe, emblem of the thirteenth arcane and the Saturnine house, Solomon's star, the symbol of the crab, an abjuration of evil spirits, some passages of Zoroaster, testimonies of the ancientness of cursed sciences. Finally, situated in the luminous field of the ventilator, and more legible in this maze of uncertainties, the hermetic term, salt, sulfur, mercury, such as the legendary tableau of the alchemist in his laboratory, a fantastic vision, devoid of truth, born from popular imagination and reproduced in old almanacs, treasures of peddling. Fellows, magicians, sorcerers, astrologers, necromancers, semicolon anathema and curse. V. Chemistry and Philosophy Chemistry is unquestionably the science of facts, as alchemy is that of causes. The former, limited to the material domain, relies on experience. The latter preferably takes its directives from philosophy. If one aims to study natural bodies, the other attempts to penetrate the mysterious dynamism that governs their transformations. This is what constitutes their essential difference and allows us to say that alchemy, compared to our positive science, the only one admitted and taught today, is a spiritualistic chemistry, because it allows us to glimpse God through the darkness of substance. Moreover, it does not seem sufficient to us to know exactly how to recognize and classify facts. It is also necessary to question nature to learn from it under what conditions, and under the influence of what will, its multiple productions take place. The philosophical mind cannot be satisfied with a mere possibility of identifying bodies. It demands knowledge of the secret of their elaboration. To partly open the door of the laboratory where nature mixes the elements is good. To discover the occult force under the influence of which its work is accomplished is better. We are far, obviously, from knowing all the natural bodies and their combinations, since we discover new ones daily. But we know enough to temporarily abandon the study of inert matter and direct our research towards the unknown animator agent of so many wonders. To say, for example, that two volumes of hydrogen combined with one volume of oxygen yield water is to state a chemical commonplace. And yet, who will teach us why the result of this combination presents, in a special state, characteristics that the gases that produced it do not possess? What, then, is the agent that imposes on the compound its new specificity and compels water, solidified by cold, to always crystallize in the same system? On the other hand, if the fact is undeniable and rigorously controlled, why is it impossible for us to reproduce it simply by reading the formula charged with explaining its mechanism? Because, in the notation H2O, the essential agent capable of provoking the intimate union of the of the gaseous elements, that is to say, fire, yet, we challenge the most skilled chemist to manufacture synthetic water by mixing oxygen and hydrogen in the indicated volumes, the two gases will always refuse to combine. To succeed in the experiment, it is essential to intervene with fire, either in the form of a spark or in the form of a body in ignition or capable of being brought to incandescence, platinum sponge. Thus, it is recognized, without the possibility of presenting any serious argument against our thesis, that the chemical formula of water is, if not false, at least incomplete and truncated. And the elementary agent fire, without which no combination can take place, being excluded from chemical notation, the entire science proves to be deficient and incapable of providing, through its formulas, a logical and verifiable explanation of the phenomena studied. Physical chemistry, writes A. E. Tart, engages the majority of research minds. It is the one that touches closest to profound truths. It is the one that will slowly deliver to us the laws capable of changing all our systems and formulas. But, by its very importance, this kind of chemistry is the most abstract and mysterious there is. The best intellects cannot, during the short moments of creative thought, arrive at the containment in the short moments of creative thought, to the containment and comparison of all the great known facts. Faced with this impossibility, recourse is made to mathematical representations. These representations are often perfect in their methods and results, but in the application to what is deeply unknown, one can only hope that mathematics discovers truths whose elements have not been entrusted to them. The most gifted person poorly formulates the problem they do not understand. If these problems could be correctly formulated into equations, there would be hope of solving them. But, in the state of ignorance we are in, we are inevitably forced to introduce numerous constants, to neglect terms, to apply hypotheses. The formulation into equations may no longer be entirely correct. However, one consoles oneself because it leads to a solution. 
but it is a temporary halt to the progress of science when such solutions are imposed for years on good minds as a scientific demonstration. Many works are done in this direction, which take time and lead to contradictory theories, destined to be forgotten. These famous theories, which were invoked and opposed to hermetic conceptions for so long, now see their solidity greatly compromised. Sincere scientists, belonging to the creative school of these same hypotheses, considered as certainties, no longer accord them more than a very relative value. Their field of action narrows parallel to the decrease in their investigative power. This is expressed, with the revealing frankness of true scientific spirit, by Mr. Emile Picard in the Revue des Du Monde. As for theories, he writes, they no longer aim to provide a causal explanation of reality itself, but only to translate it into images or mathematical symbols. The work instruments that our theories are asked to coordinate, at least for a time, known phenomena and to predict new ones. When their fertility is exhausted, efforts are made to subject them to transformations made necessary by the discovery of new facts. Thus, contrary to philosophy, which precedes facts, ensures the orientation of ideas, and their practical connection, theory, conceived afterwards, modified according to the results of experience, as acquisitions progress, always reflects the uncertainty of provisional things and gives modern science the character of perpetual empiricism. Many chemical facts, observed seriously, resist logic and defy all reasoning. Copper iodide, for example, says J. Duclos, spontaneously decomposes into iodine and cuprous iodide. Iodine being an oxidizing agent and cuprous salts being reducers, this decomposition is inexplicable. The formation of extremely unstable compounds, such as nitrogen chloride, is also inexplicable. One does not understand either why gold, which resists acids and alkalis, even concentrated and hot, dissolves in an extended and cold solution of potassium cyanide, why hydrogen sulfide is more volatile than water, why sulfur chloride, composed of two elements each of which combines with potassium impudently, has no action on this metal. We have just spoken of fire, yet, we consider it only in its common form, and not in its spiritual essence, which enters into bodies at the very moment of their appearance on the physical plane. What we wish to demonstrate, without leaving the alchemical domain, is the grave error that dominates all current science and prevents it from recognizing this universal principle that animates substance, regardless of the kingdom to which it belongs. It nevertheless manifests around us, before our eyes, either through the new properties that matter inherits from it, or through the phenomena that accompany its release. Light, rarefied and spiritual fire, the fire, spiritualized, possesses the same virtues and the same chemical power as the gross elemental fire. An experiment, aimed at the synthetic realization of hydrochloric acid, HCl, from its components, sufficiently demonstrates this. If equal volumes of chlorine gas and hydrogen gas are enclosed in a glass flask, the two gases will retain their own individuality as long as no external flame or light provokes their union. Already, in diffused light, their combination occurs gradually, but if the vessel is exposed to direct sunlight, it shatters under the force of a violent explosion. It may be objected that fire, considered as a simple catalyst, is not an integral part of the substance and therefore cannot be included in the expression of chemical formulas. The argument is more specious than true, since the experiment itself refutes it. Here is a piece of sugar, whose equation carries no equivalent for fire. If we break it in the dark, we will see a blue spark emit from it. Where does it come from? Where was it enclosed, if not in the crystalline texture of the sucrose? Semicolon we have mentioned water. Throw a piece of potassium onto its surface. It ignites spontaneously and burns vigorously. So where was this visible flame hidden? Whether it be in water, air, or metal, matters little. The essential fact is that it exists potentially within one or the other of these bodies, or even all of them. What is phosphorus, the light bearer and fire generator? How do fireflies and glowworms transform part of their vital energy into light? What compels uranyl, cerium, and zinc chromium salts to become fluorescent when exposed to sunlight? By what mysterious synchronism does barium platinum cyanide glow upon contact with x-rays? And let no one come to talk to us about oxidation in the normal order of igneous phenomena. That would be to evade the question instead of resolving it. Oxidation is a result, not a cause. It is a combination subjected to an active principle, to an agent. If certain vigorous oxidations release heat or fire, it is most certainly because this fire was first engaged there. The electric fluid, silent, obscure, and cold, travels through its metallic conductor without influencing it otherwise or manifesting its passage. But if it encounters resistance, energy immediately reveals itself with the qualities and appearance of fire. A lamp filament becomes incandescent, the charcoal of a retort ignites, 
the most refractory metal wire melts on the spot. Now, is not electricity a true fire, a fire in potential? Where does it derive its origin, if not from the decomposition, batteries, or the disintegration of metals, dynamos, bodies eminently charged with the fiery principle? Let us detach a particle of steel or iron by grinding, by striking it against flint, and we will see the spark thus set free shining. The pneumatic lighter is well known, based on the property that atmospheric air has of igniting by simple compression. Liquids themselves are often true reservoirs of fire. It is enough to pour a few drops of concentrated nitric acid on turpentine to provoke its inflammation. In the category of salts, let us mention, for memory fulminates, nitrocellulose, potassium picrate, etc. without further multiplying examples, it is seen that it would be childish to maintain that fire, because we cannot perceive it directly in matter, is not really present there and in a latent state. The old alchemists, who possessed, from traditional sources, more knowledge than we are inclined to grant them, asserted that the sun is a cold star and that its rays are obscure. Nothing seems more paradoxical or more contrary to appearance, and yet nothing is more true. A few moments of reflection allow one to be convinced of this. If the sun were a globe of fire, as we are taught, it would suffice to approach it, however little, to experience the effect of increasing heat. It is precisely the opposite that happens. High mountains remain crowned with snow despite the heat of summer. In the elevated regions of the atmosphere, when the star passes its zenith, the dome of balloons is covered with frost and their passengers suffer from a very sharp cold. Thus, experience demonstrates that the temperature decreases as the altitude increases. Even light is only made sensible to us to the extent that we find ourselves placed in the field of its radiation. If we are situated outside the radiant beam, its action ceases for our eyes. It is a well-known fact that an observer, looking at the sky from the bottom of a well at noon, sees the night sky with its stars. Where, then, do heat and light come from? Semicolon from the simple collision of cold and obscure vibrations against the gaseous molecules of our atmosphere, and as resistance increases directly with the density of the medium, heat and light are stronger. At the Earth's surface than at high altitudes, because the layers of air there are also denser. Such is, at least, the physical explanation of the phenomenon. In reality, and according to the hermetic theory, Opposition to vibratory movement, reaction, are only the primary causes of an effect which is manifested by the release of the luminous and fiery atoms of the atmospheric air. Under the action of vibratory bombardment, the spirit, freed from the body, reveals to our senses physical qualities characteristic of its active phase, luminosity, brilliance, warmth. Thus, the only reproach that can be addressed to chemical science is its failure to take into account the igneous agent the spiritual principle and basis of energetics, under the influence of which all material transformations occur. It is the systematic exclusion of this spirit, the higher will and hidden dynamism of things, which deprives modern chemistry of the philosophical character possessed by ancient alchemy. You believe, writes Mr. Henri Hellier to Mr. L. Olivier, in the indefinite fertility of experience, without doubt, but experimentation has always been guided by a preconceived idea, by a philosophy, an idea often almost absurd in appearance, a philosophy sometimes bizarre and disconcerting in its signs. If I were to tell you how I made my discoveries, said Faraday, you would take me for a fool. All the great chemists have had ideas behind their heads that they carefully avoided making known. It is from their work that we have drawn our current methods and theories. They are their most precious result, but they were not their origin. The Alembic, with its grave and composed airs, says an anonymous philosopher, has acquired an immense clientele in chemistry. Try to trust it, it is an unfaithful depository and a usurer. You entrust it with a perfectly healthy object, endowed with undeniable natural properties, having a form that constitutes its existence. It returns it to you formless, in dust or gas, and it pretends to give you everything back when it has kept everything, except the weight which is nothing since it comes from a cause independent of the body itself. And the syndicate of scientists sanctions this horrible usury. You give it wine, it returns to you tannin, alcohol, and water in equal weight. What is missing? The taste, that is to say the only thing that makes it wine, and so on. Semicolon because you have extracted three things from the wine. Gentlemen chemists, you say, wine is made from these three things. Make it again then, or I will tell you, it is three things that are made from wine. Semicolon you can undo what you have done, but you will never redo what you have undone in nature. Bodies resist you only in proportion to how strongly they are combined, and you call simple bodies those that resist you. Vanity. I like the microscope, it is content to show us things such as they are, extending simply our perception, 
It is therefore the scientists who lend him advice. But when, immersed in the smallest details, these gentlemen bring to the microscope the tiniest grain or droplet, the mocking instrument seems, by showing them living animals, to say to them, so analyze those. What then is analysis? Vanity, vanity. And finally, when a learned doctor cuts into a corpse with a scalpel to search for the causes of the disease that claimed a victim, with its help he finds only results. Semicolon for the cause of death is in that of life, and true medicine, the one practiced naturally by Christ, and which scientifically reappears with homeopathy, magnetism alike, is studied in vivo. Semicolon now, when it comes to life, since there is nothing less like a living being than a dead one, anatomy is the saddest of vanities. So are all instruments then a source of error? Far from it, but they indicate the truth within such a limited range that their truth is but vanity. Therefore, it is impossible to attach absolute truth to them. This is what I call the impossible of reality, and of which I take note to affirm the possible of the marvelous. Positive in its facts, chemistry remains negative in its spirit, and it is precisely this that differentiates it from hermetic science, whose own domain mainly includes the study of efficient causes, their influences, and the modalities they affect according to environments and conditions. It is this exclusively philosophical study that allows man to penetrate the mystery of facts, to understand their extent, and finally to identify it with the supreme intelligence, the soul of the universe, light, God. Thus alchemy, ascending from the concrete to the abstract, from material positivism to pure spiritualism, widens the field of human knowledge, the possibilities of action, and achieves the union of God and nature, of creation and creator, of science and religion. Let it be clearly understood that in this discussion, there is no unjust or tendentious criticism directed against chemists. We respect all diligent workers, regardless of their affiliations, and personally profess the deepest admiration for the great scientists whose discoveries have so magnificently enriched current science. But what men of good faith will regret with us are not so much the freely expressed differences of opinion as the unfortunate intentions of narrow sectarianism, sowing discord between the advocates of one doctrine and another. Life is too short, time too precious to waste in vain polemics, and it is hardly honorable to oneself to despise the knowledge of others. Moreover, it matters little that so many researchers go astray, if they are sincere and if their very error leads them to useful acquisitions. Errare humanum est, says the old adage, an illusion often adorns itself with the diadem of truth. Those who persevere despite failures are therefore deserving of our sympathy. Unfortunately, the scientific spirit is a rare quality among scientists, and we find this deficiency at the root of the conflicts we signal. From the fact that a truth is neither demonstrated nor demonstrable with the means available to science, one cannot infer that it will never be. The word impossible is not French, said Arago. We add that it is contrary to the true scientific spirit. To qualify something as impossible because its current possibility remains doubtful is to lack confidence in the future and to deny progress. Lemery committed a serious imprudence when he dared to write about the alchist or universal solvent. For my part, I believe it to be imaginary, for I know nothing of it. Our chemist, it must be agreed, placed a high value on the extent of his knowledge. Harry's, a brain resistant to hermetic thought, defined alchemy in this way, without ever wanting to study it. Our sign arte, cuius principium est menere, medium laborer et finis mendicare. Alongside these scholars enclosed in their ivory tower, alongside these men of undeniable merit, certainly, but slaves to tenacious prejudices, others will not hesitate to give citizenship to the old science. Spinoza, Leibniz believed in the philosopher's stone, in Chrysopia. Pascal acquired certainty about it. Closer to our time, some spirits of a high order, among them Sir Humphrey Davy, believed that hermetic research could lead to unsuspected results. Jean-Baptiste Dumas, in his lectures on chemical philosophy, expresses himself thus, would it be permissible to admit isomeric simple bodies? This question touches closely upon the transmutation of metals. Answered affirmatively, it would give chances of success to the search for the philosopher's stone. It is therefore necessary to consult experience, and experience, it must be said, is not so far in opposition to the possibility of the transmutation of simple bodies. It even opposes the idea of rejecting this idea as an absurdity demonstrated by the current state of our knowledge. Francois Vincent Raspail was a convinced alchemist, and the works of the classical philosophers occupied a prominent place among his other books. Ernest Bosque recounts that Auguste Cares, a member of the Academy of Sciences, had told him that his venerable master Chevreuil professed the greatest esteem for our old alchemists. Thus, his rich library contained almost all the important works of the hermetic philosophers. It even appears that the dean of students of France, as Chevreuil called himself, 
had learned a great deal from these old books, and owed them a part of his fine discoveries. The illustrious Chevroil, indeed, knew how to read between the lines many pieces of information that had gone unnoticed before him. One of the most famous masters of chemical science, Marcelon Berthelot, did not content himself with adopting the opinion of the school, contrary to many of his colleagues, who boldly speak of alchemy without knowing it. He devoted more than twenty years to the patient study of the original Greek and Arabic texts, and from this long association with the ancient masters, arose in him the conviction that the hermetic principles, as a whole, are as sustainable as the best modern theories. If we were not bound by the promise we made to them, we could add to these learned names the names of certain scientific authorities, entirely won over to the art of Hermes, but whose very situation obliges them to practice it only in secret. Nowadays, although the unity of substance, the foundation of the doctrine taught since antiquity by all alchemists, is accepted and officially recognized, it does not seem, however, that the idea of transmutation has followed the same progression. This fact is all the more surprising since one cannot admit one without considering the possibility of the other. On the other hand, given the high antiquity of the Hermetic thesis, one might have some reason to think that over the centuries it may have been confirmed by experience. It is true that scientists generally pay little attention to arguments of this kind. The most trustworthy and well-supported testimonies seem suspect to them, either because they are unaware of them or because they prefer to ignore them. So as not to be accused of imputing to them any malevolent intention by distorting their thoughts, and to allow the reader to exercise judgment freely, we will submit to his appreciation the opinions of modern scientists and philosophers on the subject at hand. Jean Fanot, having appealed to competent individuals, posed the following question to them. In the current state of science, is metallic transmutation possible or achievable? Can it even be considered as accomplished based on our knowledge? Here are the responses he received. Semicolon Dr. Max Nordeau. Semicolon allow me to refrain from any discussion of the transmutation of matter. I adopt the dogma, it is one, of its unity, the hypothesis of the evolution of chemical elements from the lightest atomic weight to the increasingly heavier, and even the theory, imprudently called law, of Mendeleev's periodicity. I do not deny the theoretical possibility of artificially reproducing, by laboratory means, part of this evolution, naturally produced over billions or trillions of years by cosmic forces and transforming lighter metals into gold. But I do not believe that our century will witness the realization of the alchemist's dream. Henri Poincaré, semicolon science cannot and should never say never. It is possible that one day the principle of gold making will be discovered, but for the moment the problem seems to me unsolved. Mrs. M. Curie, Semicolon if it is true that spontaneous atomic transformations have been observed with radioactive substances, production of helium by a substance, which you mention and which is perfectly accurate, it can, on the other hand, be stated that no transformation of simple substances has yet been achieved by the efforts of men and thanks to the devices imagined by them. It is therefore currently entirely useless to consider the possible consequences of gold making. Semicolon Gustav Le Bon. Semicolon it is possible to transform steel into gold as it is said to transform uranium into radium and helium, but these transformations seem to me likely only on billionths of a milligram, and it would then be much more economical to extract gold from the sea, which contains tons of it. Ten years later, a popular science magazine, conducting the same investigation, published the following opinions. Semicolon Mr. Charles Richet, professor at the Faculty of Medicine, member of the Institute, Nobel Prize winner. I confess I have no opinion on the question. Semicolon M.M. Urban and Jules Perrin, semicolon, natural forces, synthetic gold, if it is not a chimera, will not be worth exploiting industrially, unless there is a revolution in the art of exploiting, semicolon Mr. Charles Moreau, semicolon, approximately the only statement that a true scientist can make. A scientist does not assert anything a priori. Transmutation is a fact that we observe every day. The production of gold is not an absurd hypothesis. It is. To this courageously expressed thought, the thought of a bold mind endowed with the noblest scientific spirit and a profound sense of truth, we will oppose another, of a very different quality. It is the assessment of Mr. Henry Le Chatelier, member of the Institute, professor of chemistry at the Faculty of Sciences. I absolutely refuse, wrote the illustrious master, to entertain any interview on the subject of synthetic gold. I consider that it must stem from some attempt at fraud, like the famous Lemoyne diamonds. Truly, one could not demonstrate less respect for the old adepts, venerable masters of today's alchemists, with fewer words and civility. For our author, who undoubtedly never opened a hermetic book, transmutation is synonymous with charlatanism.
As disciples of these great departed ones, it seems quite natural that we should inherit their unfortunate reputation. But what does it matter? That is our glory, the only one that educated ignorance deigns to grant us, when it finds the opportunity, adorned with its qualifications, crosses, seals, palms, and parchments. But let the donkey solemnly carry its relics, and let us return to our subject. The responses we have just read, except for that of Mr. Charles Moreau, are similar in substance. They stem from the same source. The academic spirit has dictated them. Our scholars accept the theoretical possibility of transmutation. They refuse to believe in its material reality. They deny after having affirmed. It's a convenient way to stay in the expectation, not to compromise oneself, nor to leave the domain of relativities. Can we report atomic transformations involving only a few molecules of substance? How can we attribute them absolute value if we can only control them indirectly, through indirect means? Is this merely a concession that moderns make to the ancients? But we have never heard that hermetic science beg for alms. We know it well enough to be rich in observations, sufficiently endowed with positive facts not to be reduced to begging. Moreover, the theoretical idea that our chemists support today undoubtedly belongs to the alchemists. It is their very own, and no one can deny them the benefit of a recognized precedence of 15 centuries. It is these men who first demonstrated the effective realization, stemming from the unity of substance, the invulnerable foundation of their philosophy. Furthermore, we ask why modern science, equipped with multiple and powerful means, rigorous methods served by precise and perfected tools, has taken so long to recognize the truth of the hermetic principle? Therefore, we are entitled to conclude that the old alchemists, with very simple methods, nevertheless discovered, experimentally, the formal proof capable of imposing the concept of metallic transmutation as an absolute truth. Our predecessors were neither fools nor impostors, and the core idea that guided their work, the very one that infiltrates the scientific spheres of our time, is foreign to the hypothetical principles of which it is unaware of the fluctuations and vicissitudes. We therefore assert, without bias, that the great scholars whose opinions we have reproduced are mistaken when they deny the profitable result of transmutation. They misunderstand the constitution and profound qualities of matter, although they believe they have probed all its mysteries. Alas! The complexity of their theories, the heap of words created to explain the inexplicable, and above all, the pernicious influence of a materialistic education, drive them to seek far away what is within their reach. Mostly mathematicians, they lose in simplicity, in common sense, what they gain in human logic, in numerical rigor. They dream of imprisoning nature in a formula, of putting life into an equation. Thus, through successive deviations, they unconsciously stray so far from simple truth that they justify the harsh words of the gospel. They have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear. Would it be possible to bring these men to a less complicated conception of things, to guide these lost souls towards the light of the spiritualism they lack? We will try, and first of all, we will say, for the benefit of those who will kindly follow us, that one does not study living nature apart from its activity. The analysis of the molecule in the atom teaches nothing. It is incapable of solving the highest problem that a scientist can propose to himself. What is the essence of this invisible and mysterious dynamism that animates substance? Of life, indeed, what do we know, except that we find its physical consequence in the phenomenon of movement? Yet everything is life and movement here below. Vital activity, very apparent in animals and plants, is scarcely less so in the mineral kingdom, although it requires the observer to be more acute. Metals, indeed, are living and sensitive bodies, as witnessed by the mercury thermometer, silver salts, fluorides, etc. What is dilation and contraction, if not two effects of metallic dynamism? Two manifestations of mineral life? However, it is not metallic, two manifestations of mineral life? However, it is not enough for the philosopher to merely note the elongation of an iron bar subjected to heat, he must also seek out what occult will compels the metal to expand. It is known that, under the influence of heat radiation, the metal widens its pores, stretches its molecules, increases in surface area and volume. It blossoms, so to speak, like we ourselves do under the action of the beneficial solar effluvia. Therefore, we cannot deny that such a reaction has a deep, immaterial cause, for we cannot explain, without this impulse, what other force would compel the crystalline particles to depart from their apparent inertia. This metallic will, the very soul of the metal, is clearly demonstrated in one of the beautiful experiments conducted by Mr. C.H. Ed. Guillaume. A calibrated steel bar is subjected to continuous and progressive traction, the power of which is recorded using a dynamograph. When the bar is about to yield, 
it exhibits a constriction whose exact location is noted. The extension is stopped, and the bar is returned to its original dimensions. Then the test is resumed. This time, the constriction occurs at a different point from the first. By continuing the same technique, it is observed that all points have successively yielded to the same traction. Now, if the steel bar is calibrated one last time, starting the experiment anew, it is noted that a much greater force is required than the first time to provoke the return of the rupture symptoms. Mr. C.H. Ed. Guillaume concludes from these experiments, quite reasonably, that the metal behaved like an organic body. It successively reinforced all its weak parts and deliberately increases its coherence to better defend its threatened integrity. A similar teaching emerges from the study of crystallized saline compounds. If one breaks the edge of any crystal and then immerses it, thus mutilated, in the mother solution that produced it, not only is the wound immediately repaired, but it also grows at a faster rate than intact crystals left in the same solution. We find yet another clear evidence of metallic vitality in the fact that in America, railway rails exhibit, for no apparent reason, the effects of a singular evolution. Nowhere are derailments more frequent nor catastrophes more inexplicable. The engineer's task with studying the cause of these multiple ruptures attributed to the premature aging of the steel. Under the probable influence of specific climatic conditions, the metal ages quickly, prematurely, it loses its elasticity, its malleability, its strength, its toughness and cohesion appear diminished to the point of rendering it dry and brittle. This metallic degeneration, moreover, is not solely limited to rails, it also extends its ravages to the armored plates of battleships, which are generally decommissioned after a few months of use. Upon testing, it is surprising to see them break into several pieces under the impact of a simple cast iron ball. The weakening of vital energy, a normal and characteristic phase of decrepitude, of the senility of metal, is indeed the precursor sign of its imminent death. Now, death, the corollary of life, being the direct consequence of birth, it follows that metals and minerals manifest their submission to the law of predestination that governs all created beings. To be born, to live, to die, or to transform are the three stages of a single period encompassing all physical activity. And since this activity has the essential function of renewing itself, of continuing and reproducing itself through generation, we are led to think that metals, as well as animals and plants, bear within them the faculty to multiply their species. Such is the analogical truth that alchemy has endeavored to practice, and such is also the hermetic idea that it seemed necessary for us to highlight first. Thus, philosophy teaches and experience demonstrates that metals, through their own seed, can be reproduced and developed in quantity. This is also what the Word of God reveals to us in Genesis, when the Creator transmits a portion of His activity to creatures born from His very substance. For the divine command be fruitful and multiply applies not only to humans but to all living beings spread throughout nature. By the Hermetic Cabal, alchemy is only obscure because it is hidden. Those philosophers who wished to transmit to posterity the exposition of their doctrine and the fruit of their labors took great care not to divulge the art by presenting it in a common form, so that the uninitiated could not misuse it. Thus, it is through its difficulty of comprehension, through the mystery of its enigmas, the opacity of its parables that science has been relegated among reveries, illusions, and chimeras. Certainly, these old volumes bound in bister tones are not easily penetrated. To claim to read them in the manner of our own would be self-deception. However, the initial impression one receives from them, strange and confused though it may seem, remains nonetheless vibrant and persuasive. Through the allegorical language and the abundance of an equivocal nomenclature, one can discern therein that ray of truth, that deep conviction born of certain facts, duly observed and owing nothing to the fanciful speculations of pure imagination. It will undoubtedly be objected that the best hermetic works contain many gaps, accumulate contradictions, are peppered with false recipes, it will be said that the modus operandi varies among authors and that, while the theoretical development is the same for all, the descriptions of the substances employed rarely exhibit rigorous similarity among them. We will reply that the philosophers had no other resources, to conceal from some what they wanted to show to others, than this heap of metaphors, various symbols, this prolixity of terms, of capricious formulas traced in the flow of the pen, expressed in clear language for the use of the eager or the foolish. As for the argument concerning practice, it falls of its own accord for this simple reason that the initial matter being able to be envisaged in any of the multiple aspects it takes on during the work, and the artist never describing more than a part of the technique, there seem to be as many distinct procedures as there are writers in the genre. Furthermore, we must not forget that the treatises that have come down to us were composed during the most beautiful period of alchemy, 
that which spans the last three centuries of the Middle Ages. Now, at that time, the popular spirit, thoroughly imbued with Eastern mysticism, contrary to the monarch, tells us that Louvois took his measures in another way to fix, at the Invalide, his memory in an immutable and expressive manner. BL. 111. Londra, Eglise Saint Barthélemy, Triforium, La Grande Fenêtre du Prior Bolton. Enter the courtyard of the hotel, look at the mansard roofs crowning the facades of the monumental quadrilateral. When you reach the fifth of those that line the top of the eastern bay near the church, examine it closely. Its ornamentation is quite particular. A wolf is sculpted there, halfway up, its paws fall on the opening of the bullseye window, which they surround, the head is half hidden under a tuft of palm leaves, and the eyes are ardently fixed on the courtyard floor. There, without you suspecting it, is a monumental pun, as was often done for canning arms, and in this pun of stone lies the revenge, the satisfaction of the vain minister. This wolf looks, this wolf sees, it is his emblem. To leave no doubt, he had a barrel of gunpowder exploding sculpted on the adjacent mansard, to the right, a symbol of the war of which he was the impetuous minister, on the mansard to the left, an ostrich feather plume, attribute of a high and mighty lord, as he claimed to be, and yet on two other mansards of the same bay, an owl and a bat, birds of vigilance, his great virtue. Colbert, whose fortune had the same origin as that of Louvois, and who had no less vain pretensions to nobility, had chosen the serpent, Colibur, as his emblem, just as Louvois had chosen the wolf. The taste for rebuses, the last echo of the sacred language, has considerably weakened in our days, it is no longer cultivated, and it barely interests the schoolchildren of the current generation. By ceasing to provide science of heraldry with the means to decipher its enigmas, the rebus has lost the esoteric value it once possessed. We find it today relegated to the last pages of magazines, where, as a recreational pastime, its role is limited to the graphic expression of a few proverbs. Only occasionally do we notice a regular application, but often oriented towards an advertising goal, of this fallen art. Thus, a large modern firm specializing in sewing machines adopted for its advertisement a well-known poster. It depicts a seated woman, working at the machine, in the center of a majestic S. The initial of the manufacturer is especially noticeable, although the rebus is clear and of transparent meaning. This woman sews in her pregnancy, which is an allusion to the smoothness of the mechanism. Time, which ruins and devours human works, has not spared. The old hermetic language, indifference, ignorance at last have gradually launched the disintegrating action of the centuries. It cannot, however, be maintained that it is entirely lost. A few initiates still retain its rules, know how to take advantage of the resources it offers in the transmission of secret truths, or use it as a mnemonic key for teaching. In the year 1843, the conscripts assigned to the 46th Infantry Regiment, stationed in Paris, could encounter every week, crossing the courtyard of the Louis-Philippe Barracks, an unusual professor. According to an eyewitness, one of our relatives, a non-commissioned officer at the time and who diligently attended his lessons, he was a young man still, but untidy in appearance, with long hair falling in curls over his shoulders, and whose very expressive face bore the imprint of remarkable intelligence. He taught, in the evening, to the soldiers who desired it, the history of France, for a slight fee, and employed a method that he claimed was of the highest antiquity. In reality, this course, so attractive to its listeners, was based on traditional phonetic cabal. A few examples, chosen from those we have retained in memory, will give an overview of the process. After a brief prelude on about ten conventional signs intended, by their form and assembly, to retrieve all historical dates, the professor drew on the blackboard a very simplified graphic. This image, which easily engraved itself in memory, was in a way the complete symbol of the reign under study. The first of these drawings showed a figure standing at the top of a tower and holding a torch in hand. On a horizontal line, figurative of the ground, three accessories were juxtaposed, a chair, a crozier, a plate. The explanation of the schema was simple. What the man raises in his hand serves as a beacon, a hand torch, far moaned. The tower supporting him indicates the figure one. Far moaned was, it is said, the first king of France. Finally, the chair, hieroglyph of the figure four, the crozier, that of the figure two, the plate, sign of zero give the number 420, presumed date of the advent of the legendary sovereign. Clovis, we were unaware, was one of those rascals who can only be dealt with by using strong measures. Turbulent, aggressive, belligerent, quick to break everything, he dreamed only of wounds and bruises. His good parents, both to tame him and as a measure of prudence, had him screwed to his chair. The whole court knew that he was closed with screws, Clovis.
The chair and two hunting horns laid on the ground provided the date 466. Clotaire, of an indolent nature, wandered his melancholy in a field surrounded by walls. The unfortunate was thus enclosed in his land. Clotaire, Chilperic, we no longer know for what reason, wriggled in a frying pan, like a mere gudgeon, screaming at the top of his lungs, I perish here. Hence Chilperic, Dagobert took on the unpeaceful appearance of a warrior brandishing a dagger and clad in chainmail. St. Louis, who would have believed it, greatly admired the polish and shine of freshly minted gold coins. Hence, he spent his leisure time melting down his old Louis to have new ones. Louis the Ninth. As for the little corporal, rise and fall, his coat of arms required the use of no character. A table covered with its cloth and supporting a common saucepan were enough to identify him. In French, Napet Poulon, Napoleon. In English, cloth and saucepan, Napoleon. These puns, these wordplay associated not with rebuses, served as interpreters for the initiated in their verbal exchanges. In acromatic works, anagrams were reserved, sometimes to mask the author's identity, sometimes to disguise the title and withhold from the uninitiated the guiding thought. This is the case, in particular, of a very curious little book so cleverly closed that it is impossible to know what its subject is. It is attributed to Tiffane de la Roche, and it bears the singular title Amalek or the Seed of Men. It is a combination of anagram and pun. One must read alchemy or the cream of Ohm. Neophytes will learn that this is a true treatise on alchemy, because in the 13th century, alchemy, alchemy, alchemy were written, that the point of science revealed by the author relates to the extraction of the spirit enclosed in the raw material, or philosophical virgin, which bears the same sign as the celestial virgin, the monogram AUM, that finally, this extraction must be done by a process similar to that which allows the separation of cream from milk, as taught by Basile Valentin, Tolaeus, Philolithi and the characters of the Liber Mutus. By removing the veil of the title that covers it, one sees how suggestive it is, since it announces the disclosure of the secret means, suitable for obtaining this cream from the milk of a virgin, which few researchers have had the good fortune to possess. Tiffane de la Roche, almost unknown, was nevertheless one of the most learned adepts of the 18th century. In another treatise, entitled Gif and Tai, an anagram of Tiffane, he perfectly describes the photographic process and shows that he was aware of the chemical manipulations concerning the development and fixation of the image, a century before the discovery of Daguerre and Niepce de Saint-Victor. Among the anagrams intended to conceal the names of their authors, we will mention that of Le Mojon de Saint-Didier, Dive Secut Ardens, that is to say Sanctus Digerus, and the motto of President de Stampus, Spes mea est in agno. Other philosophers preferred to clothe themselves in Kabbalistic pseudonyms more directly related to the science they profess. Basile Valentin combines the Greek beta alpha sigma iota lambda epsilon sigma, king, with a Latin valens, powerful, to indicate the surprising power of the philosopher's stone. Arrhenius Philolithi appears composed of three Greek words, epsilon rho eta nu alpha omicron sigma, peaceful, phi lambda omicron sigma, friend, and lambda theta epsilon iota alpha, truth. Philolithi thus presents himself as the peaceful friend of truth. Grassus signs his works with the name Hortulane, meaning the gardener, Hortulanus, of maritime gardens, he takes care to emphasize. Ferrari is a blacksmith monk, Ferrarius, working with metals. Musa, disciple of Khaled, is Mu Omicron Sigma Alpha, the initiated, while his master, our master to all of us, is the heat released by the Athenor, Lot, Calidus, burning. Haley indicates salt. In Greek Lambda Sigma, and Ovid's metamorphoses are those of the philosopher's egg, Ovum, Ovi. Archile is more of a book title than an author's name. It is the principle of the stone, from the Greek Rho Chi, principle, and Lambda Alpha Sigma, stone. Marcel Palingene combines Mars, iron, Lambda Sigma, salt and palingenesia, regeneration, to indicate that he achieves the regeneration of the sun, or gold, through iron. Jean Austri, Gratian, Etienne share the winds, Austri, Grace, Gratia, and the crown, Sigma Tau Phi Alpha Nu Omicron Sigma, Stephanus, Femanus takes as emblem the famous chestnut, so renowned among the wise, Fama Nux, and Jean de Sacrobisco has mainly in mind the mysterious consecrated wood. Siliani is the equivalent of Silenius, of Selene, mountain of Mercury, which led to this god being nicknamed Silenian. As for the modest Gallinarius, he is content with the poultry yard and the farmyard, where the yellow chick, hatched from a black hen's egg, will soon become our wonderful golden egg-laying hen. 
without completely abandoning these linguistic artifices, the old masters, in the writing of their treatises, mainly used Hermetic Kabbalah, which they still call the language of birds, of gods, gay science or gay savoir. In this way, they were able to steal from the vulgar the principles of their science, by enveloping them in a Kabbalistic cover. This is an indisputable and well-known fact. But what is generally ignored is that the idiom from which the authors borrowed their terms is ancient Greek, the mother tongue according to the plurality of Hermes' disciples. The reason why the Kabbalistic intervention is not noticed lies precisely in the fact that French directly originates from Greek. Consequently, all the words chosen in our language to define certain secrets, having their Greek orthographic or phonetic equivalents, it suffices to know these well to immediately discover the exact, restored meaning of those. For if French, in essence, is truly Hellenic, its meaning has been modified over the centuries, as it moved away from its source and before the radical transformation that the Renaissance subjected it to, decadence hidden under the word reform. The imposition of Greek words concealed under corresponding French terms, of similar texture but more or less corrupted in meaning, allows the investigator to easily penetrate the intimate thought of the masters and to give him the key to the hermetic sanctuary. This is the method we have used, following the example of the ancients, and to which we will frequently resort in the analysis of the symbolic works bequeathed by our ancestors. Many philologists, no doubt, will not share our opinion and will remain assured, along with the general populace, that our language is of Latin origin, solely because they received the first notion of it on the benches of the college. We ourselves believed, and for a long time accepted as the expression of truth, what our teachers taught, only later, in seeking the evidence of this purely conventional filiation, did we have to recognize the vanity of our efforts and reject the error born of classical prejudice. Today, nothing can shake our conviction, repeatedly confirmed by the success achieved in the realm of material phenomena and scientific results. That is why we affirm loudly, without denying the introduction of Latin elements into our idiom since the Roman conquest, that our language is Greek, that we are Hellenes or, more accurately, Pelasgians. To the defenders of Neo-Latinism, Gaston Paris, Latre, Ménage, are now opposed by masters more discerning, of broad and free spirit, such as Hins, J. Lefebvre, Louis de Fourcade, Grainier de Cassagnac, Abbe Espignol, J. L. D'Artois, etc. And we gladly accompany them, because, despite appearances, we know they have seen correctly, judged soundly, that they follow the simple and in 1872, J. L. D'Artois one writes, Grainier de Cassagnac, in a work of marvelous erudition and pleasant style, titled, History of the Origins of the French Language, pointed out the futility of the Neo-Latinism thesis, which claims to prove that French is evolved Latin. He showed that it was not tenable, that it clashed with history, logic, common sense, and finally, that our idiom rejected it too. A few years later, Mr. Hins proved in turn, in a highly documented study published in the Revue de Linguistique, that of all the works of Neo-Latinism, it was only permissible to conclude to the kinship and not to the filiation of the so-called Neo-Latin languages. Finally, Mr. J. Lefebvre, in two remarkable and widely read articles published in June 1892 in the Nouvelle Review, completely demolished the thesis of Neo-Latinism, establishing that Abbe Espignol, in his work The Origin of French, was correct, that our language, as the greatest scholars of the 16th century had glimpsed, was Greek, that Roman domination in Gaul had only covered it with a slight layer of Latin without altering its genius. Further on, the author adds, if we ask Neo-Latinism to kindly explain to us how the Gaulish people, who numbered at least 7 million, could forget their national language and learn another, or rather change the Latin language into the Gaulish language, which is more difficult, how legionnaires, most of whom were themselves ignorant of Latin and stationed in fortified camps, separated from each other by vast spaces, could nevertheless become educators of the Gallic tribes and teach them the language of Rome, that is to say, perform in Gaul alone a miracle that the other Roman legions could not accomplish anywhere else, neither in Asia, nor in Greece, nor in the British Isles. How, finally, the Basques and the Bretons managed to preserve their idioms, while their neighbors, the inhabitants of Bayarn, Maine, and Anjou, lost theirs and were obliged to speak Latin. What does he say? This objection is so serious that it is Gaston Paris, the head of the school, who is tasked with responding. We, Neo-Latinists, he says in substance, are not obliged to resolve the difficulties that logic and history may raise. We only concern ourselves with the philological fact, and this fact dominates the question, since it alone proves the Latin origin of French, Italian, and Spanish. Certainly, Mr. J. Lefebvre retorts, the philological fact would be decisive if it were well and duly established. 
but it is not at all. With all the subtleties in the world, Neo-Latinism actually only manages to note this banal truth, namely, that there is a fair amount of Latin words in our language. Now, no one has ever contested that. As for the philological fact invoked, but by no means demonstrated, by Mr. Gaston Paris in an attempt to justify his thesis, J. L. D'Artois shows its non-existence by relying on the work of Petty Rattle. On the pretext of the Latin philological fact, he writes, one can oppose the evident Greek philological fact. This new philological fact, the only true one, the only demonstrable one, has a crucial importance, for it proves, beyond doubt, that the tribes that came to populate Western Europe were Pelasgic colonies, and confirms the fine discovery of Petty Rattle. It is known that this modest scholar, in 1802, presented before the Institute a remarkable work to prove that the monuments of polycyclic blocks found in Greece, Italy, France, and even deep into Spain, attributed to the Cyclopes, are the work of the Pelasgians. This demonstration convinced the Institute, and no doubt has arisen since then about the origin of these monuments. The language of the Pelasgians was archaic Greek, composed mainly of Aeolian and Dorian dialects, and it is precisely this Greek that is found everywhere, in France, even in the slang of Paris. The language of birds is a phonetic idiom based solely on assonance. Therefore, no account is taken of spelling, the very rigidity of which serves as a restraint to curious minds and renders unacceptable any speculation carried out outside the rules of grammar. I only attach myself to useful things, says St. Gregory in the 6th century, in a letter serving as a preface to his morals, without concerning myself with style, prepositional constructions, or inflections, because it is not worthy of a Christian to subject the words of Scripture to the rules of grammar. This means that the meaning of sacred books is not literal, and it is essential to know how to find the spirit of them through Kabbalistic interpretation, as is customary to do to understand alchemical works. The few authors who have spoken of the language of birds attribute to it the first place in the origin of languages. Its antiquity would date back to Adam, who is said to have used it to impose, according to God's order, suitable names. Bergerac reports this tradition when, as a new inhabitant of a world neighboring the sun, he has explained what hermetic Kabbala is by a little naked man, sitting on a stone, an expressive figure of simple and unclothed truth, seated on the natural stone of the philosophers. I do not remember if I spoke to him first, said the great initiate, or if it was he who questioned me, but I have a very fresh memory, as if I were still listening to him, that he discoursed to me for three long hours in a language that I know I have never heard, and that has no relation to any of this world, yet which I understood more quickly and more intelligibly than that of my nurse. He explained to me, when I inquired about such a marvelous thing, that in the sciences there is a truth, outside of which one is always far from ease, that the further a language departs from this truth, the more it is beneath conception and less easily understood. Likewise, he continued, in music, this truth is never encountered except in the soul, which is immediately uplifted and blindly follows it. We do not see it, but we feel that nature sees it, and, without being able to understand in what way we are absorbed in it, it still ravishes us, and we cannot discern where it is. The same goes for languages. Whoever encounters this truth of letters, words, and sequence can never, in expressing themselves, fall below their conception. They always speak equal to their thoughts, and it is for not having the knowledge of this perfect language that you remain short, not knowing the order or the words that could express what you imagine. I told him that the first man of our world undoubtedly used this language, because every name he had imposed on everything declared its essence. He interrupted me and continued, it is not only necessary to express everything that the mind conceives, but without it one cannot be understood by all. Since this language is the instinct or the voice of nature, it must be intelligible to everything that lives within the realm of nature. Therefore, if you had understanding of it, you could communicate and converse about all your thoughts with the beasts, and the beasts, with you, about all of theirs, because it is the very language of nature, by which she makes herself understood to all animals. Therefore, the ease with which one may sense a language that was never sounded in our ears, then no longer astonishes you. When I speak, your soul encounters, in each of my words, that truth which it gropes for, and although its reason does not understand it, it has within itself nature, which cannot fail to understand it. But this secret, universal, undefined language, despite the importance and truth of its expression, is actually of Greek origin and genius, as our author teaches us in his history of the birds. He makes ancient oaks speak, referring to the language used by the Druids, Rho Epsilon Iota Nu, from Delta Rho Sigma, Oak. In this manner, consider the oaks to which we feel your gaze attached. It is we who forgive you, and if you are surprised that we speak. A language used in the world where you visit, 
know that our forefathers originated from it. They lived in Epirus, in the forest of Dodona, where their natural goodness prompted them to give oracles to the afflicted who consulted them. For this purpose, they had learned the Greek language, the most universal at that time, in order to be understood. The Hermetic Kabbalah was known in Egypt, at least in the priestly caste, as evidenced by the invocation in the Leiden Papyrus. I invoke you, the most powerful of gods, who created everything, you, born of yourself, who sees all, without being able to be seen. I invoke you by the name you possess in the language of the birds, in that of the hieroglyphs, in that of the Jews, in that of the Egyptians, in that of the Sinocephaly, in that of the hawks, in the hieratic language. We also find this language among the Incas, rulers of Peru until the time of the Spanish conquest. The ancient writers called it lengua general, universal language, and lengua coeta, court language, meaning diplomatic language, because it conceals a double meaning corresponding to a double science, one apparent, the other profound, delta iota pi lambda, double, and mu theta eta, science. The Kabbalah, says Father Pernod I, was an introduction to the study of all sciences. By presenting us with the powerful figure of Roger Bacon, whose genius shines in the intellectual firmament of the 13th century like a star of the first magnitude, Armand Parrot II describes to us through what work he could acquire the synthesis of ancient languages and possess such an extensive practice of the mother tongue that he could, through its means, teach in a short time the languages reputed to be the most ungrateful. This, it will be agreed, is a truly marvelous characteristic of this universal language, which appears to us at once as the best key to the sciences and the most perfect method of humanism. Bacon, writes the author, New Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Arabic, and, having thus put himself in a position to draw rich instruction from ancient literature, he had acquired a reasoned knowledge of the two vernacular languages he needed to know, that of his native country and that of France. From these particular grammars, a mind such as his could not fail to rise to the general theory of language. He had opened up the two sources from which they flow, which are, on the one hand, the positive composition of several idioms, and on the other, the philosophical analysis of the human understanding, the natural history of its faculties and its conceptions. Thus, we see him almost alone in a century, engaged in comparing vocabularies, bringing together syntaxes, investigating the relationships between language and thought, measuring the influence that the character, movements, and varied forms of discourse exert on the habits and opinions of peoples. He thus traced back to the origins of all simple or complex notions, fixed or variable, true or erroneous, that speech expressed. This universal grammar seemed to him to be the true logic, the best philosophy, he attributed to it so much power that, with the help of such a science, he believed himself capable of teaching Greek or Hebrew in three days one, just as to his young disciple, Jean de Paris, he had learned in one year what had cost him forty, the lightning speed of common sense education. Strange power, says Mr. Michelet, to draw, with the electric spark, the pre-existing science into the brain of man. 7. Alchemy and Spadgeri. It is to be presumed that a good number of scholarly chemists, and certainly some alchemists as well, will not share our viewpoint. This should not stop us. Even if we were to be considered as a resolute advocate of the most subversive theories, we would not fear to develop our thought here, believing that the truth has many more attractions than a vulgar prejudice, and that it remains preferable. All the authors who have written, since Lavoisier, on the chemical history, agree to profess that our chemistry comes, through direct lineage, from the old alchemy. Consequently, the origin of one is accountable for the other. This signifies that the current science is indebted to the positive facts on which it was built, the work of ancient alchemists. This hypothesis, to which one could have only attributed a relative and conventional value had it been demonstrated, the alchemical science, accepted today as truth, devoid of its own substance, loses all that could justify its existence, to justify its raison d'etre. Seen in this light, at a distance, through the legendary mists and consistency, it offers no more than a vague, nebulous form, a deceptive chimera, a lying specter, the wonder, without yesterday's merit, is indeed worthy of being relegated to the rank of illusions, of false sciences, as a very distinguished professor would wish. However, where evidence would be necessary, or where facts affirm themselves indispensably, one is content to oppose to the pretensions of hermeticism a petition of principle. The school, authoritative, does not argue, it decides. Well then, we certify, in turn, by proposing to demonstrate, that the learned men who have, in good faith, embraced and propagated this hypothesis, have been misled by ignorance or lack of penetration. Only partially understanding the books they studied, they mistook appearance for reality. 
let us state clearly, since so many educated and sincere people seem to ignore it, that the true ancestor of our chemistry is the ancient spagyric, and not the hermetic science itself. Indeed, there is a profound abyss between spagyri and alchemy. It is precisely what we shall endeavor to extricate, as far as it will be expedient to do so without overstepping the permitted bounds. We hope, however, to push the analysis far enough and provide sufficient precision to nourish our thesis. Happy moreover to give to the disillusioned chemists a testimony of our good will and of our sincere solicitude. There was in the Middle Ages, probably even in antiquity if we refer to the works of Zosimos and Austanes, two orders of research in the chemical science, spagyri and alchemy. These two branches of the same art are, the spagyric and the alchemic. Exotic practices were diffused within the laborious class through the practice of the laboratory. Metallurgists, painters, ceramists, glassmakers, dyers, distillers, enamelers, potters, etc., had to be, as much as apothecaries, endowed with sufficient spagyric knowledge to complete their own, in turn, within the specific field. They thus formed, subsequently, a special, more restricted, and also more obscure category among ancient chemists. The goal they pursued presented some analogy with that of alchemists, but the materials and means at their disposal were purely chemical in nature, transmuting metals from one to another, producing gold and silver from common or salt metallic minerals, forcing the potentially contained gold into silver, gold into tin, a clever and unattainable dream, that which the alchemist had in mind. It was definitively a spagyrist confined to the mineral kingdom who totally neglected animal quintessences and vegetable alkaloids. However, the medical regulations defending the possession of their chemicals, without prior authorization, and the large quantity of chemical utensils that craftsmen, once their labor was finished, studied, manipulated, experimented with in secret in their cellar or their attic. They cultivated the science of little artisans, according to the somewhat disdainful expression of some alchemists for these useful researchers, the most fortunate of whom often derived only a mediocre benefit, and a process initially followed with success, which then only yielded null or uncertain results. Nevertheless, despite their errors, rather because of them, these are the arch-chemists, who first provided to the spagyrist and then to modern chemistry, the facts, methods, operations they needed. They are men tormented by the desire to search and to learn everything, the true founders of a splendid and perfect science, who on their own initiative, observations just, manipulations delicate, the fruit of the master's hand, have acquired. Let us salute very lowly these pioneers, these precursors, these great laborious ones and let us never forget what they did for us. But let us repeat, alchemy contributes nothing to these contributions. Only hermetic writings, investigators profane, were the cause. It was because of them that the discoverers of new agents hadn't noticed. This is how Blaise de Vigenaire obtained benzoic acid by sublimating benzoin, how Brandt could extract phosphorus while searching for the alkahest within urine, how Basile Valentin, a prestigious adept who did not despise practical essays either. Exotic practices were diffused within the laborious class by the practice of the laboratory. Metallurgists, goldsmiths, painters, ceramists, glassmakers, dyers, distillers, enamelers, potters, etc., as much as apothecaries, had to be endowed with sufficient spagyric knowledge to complete them on their own, in turn, within the field of their trade. They thus formed a special category, more restricted and also more obscure among the ancient chemists. The goal they pursued presented some analogy with that of the alchemists, but the materials and means at their disposal were purely chemical. Transmuting metals into one another, producing gold and silver from common or salt metallic ores, binding the potentially contained gold into silver, gold into tin, a clever and unreachable dream, that was what the alchemist had in view. It was definitely a spagyrist confined to the mineral kingdom who totally neglected animal quintessences and vegetable alkaloids, or, the medical regulations defending the possession of their chemicals, without prior authorization, and the large quantity of chemical utensils that craftsmen, once their labor was finished, studied, manipulated, experimented with in secret in their cellar or their attic. They cultivated the science of little artisans, According to the somewhat disdainful expression some alchemists held for these useful researchers, the most fortunate of whom often derived only a mediocre benefit, and a process initially followed with success, which then only yielded null or uncertain results. Nevertheless, despite their errors, rather because of them, these are the arch-chemists, who first provided to the spagyrist and then to modern chemistry, the facts, methods, operations they needed. They are men tormented by the desire to search and to learn everything, the true founders of a splendid and perfect science that they have built on their own initiative, observations just, manipulations delicate, 
the fruit of the master's hand, have acquired. Let us salute very lowly these pioneers, these precursors, these great laborious ones and let us never forget what they did for us. But let's repeat, alchemy contributes nothing to these contributions. Only hermetic writings, investigators profane, were the cause. It was because of them that the discoverers of new agents hadn't noticed. This is how Blaise de Vigenaire obtained benzoic acid by sublimating benzoin, how Brandt could extract phosphorus while searching for the alkahest within urine, how Basile Valentin, a prestigious adept who did not despise practical essays either. It was established that the series of antimonial salts and the colloidal gold rubies, that Raymond Lola prepared acetone and Cassius the purple of gold, that Glauber obtained sodium sulfate and that Van Helmont recognized the existence of gases. But, with the exception of Lola and Basile Valentin, all these researchers, classified among the alchemists, were only simple archchemists according to the classic spagirist. This is why a famous adept, author of a classic work, could say with much reason, if Hermes, the father of the philosophers, resuscitates today with the subtle gay bear, the profound Raymond Lola, they would not be regarded as philosophers by our vulgar chemists who would nearly not dare to put them to work for ignoring the ways to proceed with all these ignitions, these circulations, these calcinations, and all these immovable operations that our vulgar chemists have invented, for having misunderstood the allegorical writings of these philosophers. With their texts confused, enameled with cabalistic expressions, the books remain the cause of this confusion and the misapprehension that we point out. Because, despite the coarse mistakes that their authors warn against, the students stubbornly persist in reading them in the sense they offer in current language. They do not know that these texts are reserved for the initiated and that it is indispensable, to properly understand, to hold the secret key, it is to discover this key that one must primarily work. Certainly, these old treatises contain, if not an integral science, at least its philosophy, its principles, the art of applying them according to the natural laws. But if the signification of certain terms, for example, Aries, what distinguishes it from Darius and brings it closer to Darl, or Darnay and Albate, strange qualifiers deliberately employed in the writing of such works, one must fear to understand nothing or to be invariably misled. We must not forget that it is a matter of an esoteric science. Therefore, a lively intelligence, an excellent memory, work and attention aided by strong will are not sufficient qualities to hope to become learned in the sublime philosophy. Those who abstain strongly, writes Nicholas Grimoaldus, who clearly says that we have made books only for them, but we don't want to discard all those who are not from our sect. Batsturf, at the start of his treatise, charitably warns the reader saying, every prudent man, he says, should first learn science, if he can, that is to say, the principles and the ways of proceeding, instead of staying there, without wisely using his time and his goods. Today, I warn those who will read these few pages. For let them once be convinced that they will never learn this sublime science through books, and that it can only be learned by divine revelation, that's why we call it divine art, or by means of a good and faithful master, and as there are very few to whom God has granted this grace, there are also few who heal. Finally, an anonymous author from the 18th century gives other reasons for the difficulty that the supreme divine science presents. Here, he writes, is the first and real cause for which nature has hidden this palace open and royal to so many philosophers, even to those endowed with a very subtle mind. It is because, departing from their youth, they have cherished the lamp more than the logical conclusions and metaphysics, and, deceived by their conclusions of the latter, they imagine and swear that this art is deeper, more difficult to understand than any metaphysics, even though naive nature, in its path as in all others, proceeds with a straight and very simple step. These are the opinions of the philosophers on their own works. How can we be surprised, then, that so many excellent chemists have gone astray, that they have been deceived in discussing a science of which they were incapable of assimilating the most elementary notions? And would it not be to render a service to others, to the neophytes, to engage them to meditate on this great truth proclaimed by the imitation, Book 3, Chapter 2, Verse 2, when it says, speaking of sealed books, they can well make the sound of their words heard but they do not impart understanding. They provide the letter, but it is the Lord who reveals the meaning. They propose mysteries, but it is he who explains them. They show the path that must be followed, but it is he who gives the strength to walk it. This is the philosopher's stone that the spagyricists and alchemists stumble over. And we can assert against which our chemists have stumbled, that if the old alchemists, those not versed in the language, had known the laws of the practice of Hermes, the secrets would be known and the philosophical stone would have ceased, a long time ago, to be considered as chimerical. We have asserted above that the alchemists regulated their works on the hermetic theory, at least as they understood it, and that was the starting point of fruitful. 
experiments yielding tangible chemical facts. By parting from experiences following the analysis, by using acids that dissolve the metallic bases we employ, and by the action of these on salts of a metallic nature, they obtain the saline series that we know. By reducing these salts, either by other metals, by alkalis or by carbon, either by the sun or by fatty bodies, they rediscovered, without transformation, the basic bodies that they had previously combined. However, their attempts, as well as the methods they used, did not present any difference from those currently practiced in laboratories. Some researchers, however, pushed their investigations much further. They extended singularly the field of chemical possibilities, to the point that their results seemed doubtful if not imaginary. It is true that these processes are often incomplete and wrapped in a mystery almost as dense as that of the great work. Our intention being, as we have announced, to treat this subject with all the details and we will show that these sulfur recipes offer more experimental certainty than one would be inclined to attribute to them. That the philosophers, our brothers, from whom we ask indulgence, would deign to forgive us these divulgations. But, besides our oath that raises us uniquely in spagyric and that we strictly intend to honor on the terrain of alchemy, we desire to promise, firmly relying on the promise that we have made to demonstrate, on one hand, the demurrers and, on the other, the real and verifiable facts, that our chemistry owes everything to the spadgerists and alchemists, and nothing, absolutely nothing, to the chimerical philosophy hermetic. The simplest archaic procedure consists of using the effect of violent reactions, acids on bases, in order to provoke, within the effervescence, the reunion of pure parts, their irreducible assembly in the form of new bodies. Thus, starting with a metal neighboring gold, preferably silver, one can produce a small quantity of precious metal. Here, in this order of research, is an elementary operation of which we certify the success, if one follows our indications well. Pour pure nitric acid into a glass retort, tall and tubulated, one-third of its volume. Fit a recipient with a tube in the flask. Heat the apparatus on a sand bath. Operate under a hood, as the fumes are toxic and you could be exposed to boiling acid. Stop heating gently and without reaching the boiling point of the acid. Then open the tubulation and introduce a small fraction of pure silver, free from gold traces. Use a crucible that contains no gold traces. When the nitrogen dioxide fumes and the effervescence have calmed, let fall into the liquid a second portion of pure silver. Repeat the introduction of the metal, unhurriedly, until the boiling and release of red fumes show little energy, indicating a nearing saturation. Add nothing more, let settle for half an hour. Then carefully decant, in a beaker, your clear solution still hot. You will find at the bottom of the retort a thin deposit of brown powder. Wash it with lukewarm distilled water and let it fall into a porcelain capsule. You will recognize by tests that this precipitate is insoluble in hydrochloric acid, as it is in nitric acid. The water is regulated and gives a magnificent yellow solution, absolutely similar to that of gold trichloride. Spread this liquor with distilled water, precipitate with a zinc strip, a very fine amorphous powder will deposit, very similar to the brown smoke identical to that which gives gold its natural color in the same way. Wash it several times, then dry the powdery precipitate. Rubbed on glass or marble, it will give you a shiny sheet, a reflection of a beautiful yellow hue seen by reflection, greenish in color by transparency, and the superficial characteristics of the purest gold. In order to increase the quantity of your new minuscule deposit, you may repeat the operation as often as you wish. In this case, Take up again the clear solution of silver nitrate you extended with the first washing waters. Reduce the metal by zinc or copper. Decant and wash abundantly when the reduction is complete. Dry this powdered silver and use it for your second dissolution. By continuing in this way, you will amass enough metal to make the analysis more convenient. Moreover, you will be sure of its true production, even assuming that the silver initially used contained some traces of gold. But is this simple body, so easily obtained albeit in small proportion, really gold? Our sincerity compels us to say no, or at least, not yet. For while it presents the most perfect analogy externally with gold, and even most of its properties and chemical reactions, it nonetheless lacks one essential physical characteristic, density. This gold is less heavy than natural gold, although its density is superior. This superiority is not to be viewed as equal to that of natural gold, and even less as a replacement for silver. It remains remarkable, therefore, that what we call native silver, presenting an allotropic state, which has never yet revealed the recent formation of young gold, or newly formed gold. The density remains subject to elevation by compression. Moreover, the qualities using a process that possesses the metal to keep and to conserve, specific qualities of adult gold, would assure all the archimaturation or firming, and they named this technique the main one. 
We find it cited in some Latin manuscripts where Mercury was the principal agent, the expression of confirmatio. It would be easy for us to make some remarks on the operation that we have just indicated, several of its important and consequent philosophical principles, and to demonstrate directly on the metal. We could also suspect that some variation could increase the yield, but we voluntarily impose certain limits on ourselves. We leave to others the care to discover these and to deduce them from experience. Our role is, limited to presenting the facts, to modern alchemists, spagyrists, and chemists to conclude. But there are, in alchemy, other methods whose results provide the proof of philosophical assertions. They allow the decomposition of metallic bodies, long considered as simple elements. These processes, which the alchemists knew, although they did not use them in the development of the great work, aimed at extracting one of the two radical metallic principles, sulfur and mercury. Hermetic philosophy teaches us that bodies have no action on their own, and that only spirits are active and penetrating. It is they, the spirits, these natural agents that provoke, within matter, the transformations that we observe. Now, wisdom demonstrates through experience that bodies form among themselves only temporary combinations easily reducible, such as the case with alloys, some of which liquefy by simple fusion, and all saline compounds. Likewise, allied metals retain their specific qualities despite the diverse properties they take on in a state of dissociation. We thus understand how useful can be the spirits that emanate from sulfur or from mercury metals, when we know that they alone are capable of overcoming the strong cohesion that binds closely these two principles. Previously, it is essential to know what the ancients meant by the generic and quite vague term of spirits. For the alchemists, the spirits are real influences, although physically almost immaterial or imponderable. They act in a mysterious, inexplicable, but effective manner on the substances subjected to their action and prepared for their reception. The lunar radiance is one of these hermetic spirits. As for the alchemists, their conception is shown to be more concrete and substantial. Our old chemists include under the same category all bodies, simple or complex, solid or liquid, provided with a volatile quality capable of making them entirely sublimable. Metals, metalloids, salts, hydrogen carbides, etc., provide the alchemists with their contingent of spirits. Mercury, arsenic, antimony and some of their compounds, sulfur, ammonium salt, alcohol, ether, vegetable essences, etc. In the extraction of metallic sulfur, the favorite technique is that which uses sublimation. Here are, as an indication, a few ways to proceed. Dissolve pure silver in hot nitric acid, according to the pulsation previously described, then extend this solution with distilled water until it is slightly cloudy. Decant the clear liquor to separate it, if there is any, a lighter deposit, then put it in the dark part. Let cool in a dark place and pour into a vessel. Use a saturated sodium chloride solution, or pure hydrochloric acid. The silver chloride will fall to the bottom of the vessel in the form of a white curdled mass. After resting for 24 hours, decant the water which floats above, wash quickly with cold water and let dry spontaneously in a place where there is no dust. You will then have your silver chloride to which you will intimately mix three times as much pure ammonium chloride. Introduce everything into a high glass retort of the capacity to hold the saline mixture. Give it the heat so that the bottom may be occupied by the hot sand. When the temperature is sufficient, the ammoniacal salt will cover with a layer of ferrous earth the rod and the neck of the retort equally. This sublimate, of a shining white color, rarely contains impurities, which would make one think that it contains nothing of particular note. Cut then carefully from the retort, detach with care this white sublimate, dissolve it in distilled water, cold or hot. The finished dissolution, you will find at the bottom a very fine powder, of a brilliant red, it is a part of silver sulfur, or lunar sulfur, detached from the metal and volatilized by the ammoniacal salt during the sublimation. This operation, however, despite its simplicity, is not without serious inconveniences. Under its easy appearance, it demands great skill, a lot of caution in the handling of fire. It is necessary, first of all, if one does not want to lose half or more of the metal used, to especially avoid the fusion of the salts, or, if the temperature rises beyond the degree required to determine and maintain the fluidity of the mixture, there will be no sublimation. On the other hand, as soon as it is established, the silver chloride, already very penetrating by itself, acquires, in contact with the ammoniacal salt, such a mordant that it passes through the walls of the glass and escapes outside. Very frequently, the retort cracks when the phase of vaporization begins, and the ammoniacal salt sublime to the exterior. The artist does not even have the resource of grass, earth or porcelain retorts, more porous even than those of glass, as much as he must be able to constantly observe the progress of the reactions, 
if he wishes to be in a position to intervene at the opportune moment. Therefore, in this method as in many others of the same order, there are certain practical secrets that the alchemists have prudently kept reserved. One of the best consists in using one of the mixtures of salts and better proportioning the bodies, to adapt them to the chloride and prevent their liquefaction. This material must possess neither reductive quality nor catalytic virtue. It is also essential that it can be easily isolated from the kaput mortuum. In the past, crushed brick and various absorbents such as potter's earth, pumice stone, powdered flint, etc. were used. Unfortunately, these substances furnish, unfortunately, a very impure sublimate. We give preference to a certain product, devoid of any affinity with the chlorides of silver and ammonium, which we extract from the dung of Judea. Besides the purity of the sulfur obtained, the technique becomes easy. One can, comfortably, reduce the silver residue to metallic sulfur, and the leftover sulfur from the extraction process does not revert to metal and presents itself under the form of a gray ash, soft, very gentle, greasy to the touch, retaining the impression of the finger, and which yields, in a short time, half of its weight in mercury precipitate. This technique is also applied to lead. Cheaper, it has the advantage of providing salts insensitive to light, which frees the artist to operate in darkness. It is not necessary to employ imbibition. Finally, like less volatile sulfur than silver, the yield in red sublimate is better and the time is shortened. The only unfortunate side of the operation comes from the fact that the ammoniacal form, with the sulfur of lead, forms a saline layer so compact and tenacious that one would believe it to be melted. It becomes laborious to detach it without grinding. As for the extract itself, it is a beautiful red, coated in a strongly colored sublimate, but very impure compared to that of silver. It doesn't matter, the process is less perfect in the eye of the layman. Its maturity is also less perfect, an important consideration if the research is oriented towards obtaining particular tinctures. Not all metals obey the same chemical agents. The procedure suitable for silver and lead cannot be applied to tin, copper, or gold. Moreover, the spirit capable of isolating the sulfur of a given metal will exert its action, with another metal, on the mercurial principle of the latter. In the first case, mercury will be strongly retained, while the sulfur will sublime. In the second, it is the inverse phenomenon that occurs. Hence the diversity of methods and the variety of techniques of metallic decomposition. It is, after all, particularly the affinity that the bodies manifest for one another, and these for the spirits, which generally govern the application. We know that silver and lead have a mutual sympathy very marked. The miners of lead silver prefer to process enough ore. If it's established that philosophic mercury is the chemical agent of these bodies, it is logical to think that the same spirit, employed under the same conditions, will determine the same effects. This is what happens with silver and gold, which are linked by a close affinity. When our Mexican miners come across a sandy land mostly composed of iron oxide, they conclude that gold is not far. Also, they consider this red ochre as the mother of gold, and the best indication of a nearby vein. The fact seems quite singular, being given the physical differences of these metals. In the category of usual metallic bodies, we enter among the rich and extreme ones, for example, certain specimens of pure native gold, but it is mostly the one that we find, on the contrary, only in the mines or in considerable and numerous deposits, but also disseminated on the surface of the soil. The traveler must give special attention to the red mud that is so much despised. It is vitriolated, burnt, if it is under the form of sesquioxide, a color which is exalted still by the cooking, bricks, tiles, pottery. Of all the ferruginous masses, pyrite is the most vulgar and the most common. Ferruginous masses, blackish, in rounded clumps, are frequently found in heaps, in regions, and are commonly encountered in fields, at the edge of paths, on chalky terrain. Children in the countryside are accustomed to playing with marcasite which shows, when broken, a fibrous, crystalline and radiated texture. They sometimes contain small quantities of gold. The meteorites, composed mainly of magnetic metal, prove that the masses interplanetary from which they come must owe the majority of their structure to iron. Certain plants contain assimilable iron, watercress, lentils, beans, potatoes. Man and animals need iron for their coloration, the red hue of blood and flesh. Indeed, Iron salts are the active element of hemoglobin. They are even so necessary to organic vitality that medicine and the pharmacopoeia have always sought to provide blood with metallic compounds suitable for its reconstitution, iron peptonate and carbonate. Amongst the people, the use of water rendered ferruginous by the immersion of oxidized nails has been preserved. Finally, iron salts present such a variety in their coloration that one could assure that they would suffice to reproduce all the tonalities of the spectrum, from the violet, 
which is the proper color of the metal pure, to the intense red it gives to silica and the various types of rubies and garnets. It is not to incite alchemists to work on iron, in the design of discovering the components of their tinctures. Moreover, this metal easily lets its constituents be extracted, sulfurous and mercurial, in a single manipulation, which is already quite advantageous. The great, the enormous difficulty lies in the fusion of the elements, which, despite their impurity, refuse energetically to combine again to form a new body. But we will not dwell on this to solve the problem, since our subject is limited to establishing the proof that the alchemists of former times employed these in the spagyric treatment of iron, it is the energetic reaction of acids, having a similar affinity for the metal, that one utilizes for material cohesion. We start ordinarily with the martial pyrite, or the vitriol lime and lime eel. In this last case, we recommend using caution and precaution. If we address the pyrite, it suffices to grind it as finely as possible and to redden this powder on the fire, once only, by strongly stirring it. Cooled, we introduce it into a large balloon with four times its volume of regal water, and we bring everything to a boil. After about an hour or two, we let it rest, decant the liquor, then pour it over the magma with a similar quantity of new regal water that we boil like the precedent. It is necessary to continue the boiling and decantation until the pyrite appears white and without iron in the water. We then take up all the extracts, filter them through silk and concentrate them by slow distillation in a tubulated retort. When one rests on the third part of the volume diminished, we open the tubulation and pour by successive fractions, maintaining a certain quantity of pure sulfuric acid at 660, 60 grams per volume total extract from 500 grams of pyrite. We distill until it is dry, and after changing the recipient, we proceed with a little temperature. We will see distilling in the bottles, little by little, a blood-like substance, which represents the sulfur tincture, then a beautiful white sublimate, which attaches to the vault and the neck under the aspect of crystalline down. This sublimate is a veritable vitriol, mercury, called by some ancient chemists mercury of the sages, that one redoes again in mercury fluid by the lime eel of iron, the quick lime or the anhydrous potassium carbonate. We can moreover immediately assure ourselves that this sublimate contains indeed the specific mercury of iron, by rubbing the crystals on a lame of copper, the amalgam is produced immediately and the metal turns white. As for the iron lime eel, it furnishes a sulfur of golden color, instead of being red, and a little, very little, of sublimated mercury. The process is the same, but with this slight difference that it is necessary to pour into the regal water, previously heated, pinches of lime eel and to wait, three candles time, that the effervescence since pacified. It is good to stir the bottom with an agitator to avoid that the lime eel does not form a mass. After filtration and reduction to half, one adds, very little at a time, because the reaction is violent and the fumes furious, of the sulfuric acid up to half the volume of this concentrated liquor. This is the dangerous side of the manipulation because it often happens that the retort explodes or that it cracks at the level of the acids. We will stop here the description of the processes on iron, estimating that they are sufficient to support our thesis, and we will end the exposition of acids spagyrically suitable for the eye, legally said, following the opinion of all philosophers, the most refractory body to dissolution. It is a common axiom in spagyric that it is easier to make gold than to destroy it. But here, a brief observation is imposed. Strictly speaking, our desire to prove the chemical reality of the research as archimistically noted leads us to be clear how one can manufacture gold. The goal we pursue is of a higher order, and we prefer to remain in the pure alchemical domain, rather than engaging in the search, for covered trails and bordered by foundries. Because the application of these methods, by affirming the chemical principle of transmutations directly, could not bring the least testimony in favor of the great work, whose elaboration remains completely foreign to this same principle. That said, let us return to our subject. An old spagyric saying claims that the seed of gold is in the gold itself, we will not contradict it, provided that one knows what it is in question, or how it is convenient to seize the secret of the degasification. If I ignore the manner of capturing these secrets, one will necessarily have to be content with witnessing the production of the phenomenon itself, without drawing any other profit than an objective certainty. Observe closely what happens in the following operation, whose execution presents no difficulty. Dissolve pure gold in aqua regia. Pour in sulfuric acid in weight equal to half the weight of gold used. There will be a slight contraction. Shake the solution and introduce it into a non-tubulated glass retort, arranged on a sand bath. Give initially a mediocre heat, so that the distillation of the acids occurs smoothly and without boiling. When nothing distills any more and the gold will appear at the bottom under the aspect of a yellow, dull, dry and cavernous mass, 
Change the recipient and gradually increase the heat of the furnace. You will see rising light vapors, white, opaque, lighter at first, then progressively heavier. The first branches will condense into a beautiful yellow oil that will flow to the recipient. The second ones will sublimate and garnish the vault and the birth of the neck with fine crystals imitating the product of the birds. Their color, a red of blood of striking magnificence, will dazzle with a singular luster when the full light strikes them. These crystals, very deliquescent, which are like other salts of gold, are dissolved in yellow liquor as soon as the temperature falls. We will not further pursue the study of sublimations. As for the archimic processes known under the expression of little particulars, these are most often aleatory techniques. The best of these processes are based on metallic products extracted according to the methods we have indicated. They are commonly found abundant in the works of the older doctrine and the writings of sulfur seekers. We will bore ourselves, as a direct demonstration, to reproduce the particular that Bozile Valentin mentions, because, compared to others, it is supported by solid and pertinent philosophical reasons. The great adept asserts, in this passage, that one can obtain a particular tint by suffusing mercury with the sulfur of copper by the intercession of salt. Herein, he says, lies a fixed mercury by which it sustains itself longer against the violence of fire than other imperfect metals, and the victory it brings shows quite how fixed it is, given that devouring Saturn consumes very little or none at all. The lascivious Venus is well colored, and can hardly lose or diminish her tint almost identical to that of the sun, which, because of its excellent abundance, pulls greatly towards the red. But as long as her body is leprous and diseased, the tint can't make its home there, and the body flying away, the tint must necessarily follow, because this soul, if the fire does not appear and is not left with any siege or refuge, by the same fire, disappears and the light being left no seed or refuge, which on the contrary, accompanied, remains all with a fixed body. The fixed salt gives to the warrior Mars a body hard, strong, solid and robust, from which his magnanimity and great courage come. It is therefore difficult to surmount the valuable body on account of its grandness and hardiness that one can hardly injure. But if someone mixes his strength and hardness with the constancy of the moon and the beauty of Venus, and matches them by a spiritual means, he will be able to create not too badly a sweet harmony, by means of which the poor man, having used this effect of some keys of our art, after having mounted to the highest shelf that the art holds, he could have particularly saved his life. For the phlegmatic and humid moon can be overheated and desiccated by the hot and choleric blood of Venus, and its great harshness corrected by the salt of Mars. Among the alchemists who used gold to increase it, with the help of formulas that led them to success, we will mention the Venetian priest Pontalio, Naxagoras, author of the Alchimia de Nudata, 1751. We will not discuss further the famous Moritz, Bernard de Labati, Joseph Duchesne, ordinary doctor to King Henry IV, Blaise de Vigenaire, Barden, from Haver, 1638, Miss de Martinville, 1610, Yardley, inventor of an English process transmitted to Mr. Garden, Glover in London, in 1716, then communicated to Mr. Ferdinand Hockley to Dr. Sigismund Bockstrom, and which was the subject of a letter from him to Mr. L. Sand, in 1804. Finally, the pious philanthropist St. Vincent de Paul, founder of the Père de la Mission, 1625, of the Congregation of the Sœur de la Charité, 1634, etc. May this sheet allow us to pause for a moment on this great and noble figure, as well as on his hidden labor, generally ignored. It is known that during a journey he made from Marseille to Narbonne, St. Vincent de Paul was captured by Barbary pirates and taken captive to Tunis. He was then 24 years old. It is also assured that he managed to convert his last master, a renegade, back to the bosom of the church, that he returned to France and stayed in Rome, where Pope Paul V received him with great consideration. It is from this time that he began his pious foundations and charitable institutions. But what must be carefully mentioned, is that the Père des Enfants Trouvé, as he called himself during his life, had learned alchemy during his captivity. Thus it is explained, without there being any need, for a miraculous intervention, that the great apostle of charity, the Christian initiator of the relief of the needy and of tropical works, was also a practical, positive man, resolved, not neglecting his affairs, in no way dreamy nor inclined to mysticism. He was, besides, a deeply human soul beneath the rough exterior of an active, tenacious, ambitious man. We possess two very suggestive letters from him. Concerning the first, written to Mr. de Comet, lawyer at the Parlement of Dax, was published several times and analyzed by Mr. Grasset-Bois, in the Peril Occultist, Paris, Victor Rito, undated. 
It is written from Avignon and dated June 24, 1607. We will assume that the mission for which Monsieur Vincent de Paul, at that time still a layman, found himself in Marseille, preparing to reach Toulouse. Being about to travel by land, he said, I was persuaded by the gentleman with whom I was staying to embark with him to Narbonne, seeing the favor of the times that were. To do this I went to Antibes, with the intention of sparing myself, or rather to not risk everything in all, but to lose all in the end. The wind also being favorable that we should reach Narbonne the same day it rose, which quite rarely happens, God did not allow but that three Turkish brigantines that were scouring the Gulf of Leon, to intercept the boats coming from Beaucaire, where it was fair that one estimates to be of the most beautiful of Christianity, gave us chase and attacked us so vigorously that two of ours were killed on the spot and all the rest wounded, myself included, who received an arrow shot that will serve me for a watch throughout the rest of my life, had we not been forced to surrender to these dogs of pirates. The first bursts of rage in which they killed our pilot and another pilot who had come up from the mainmast were the primary causes, in addition to four or five thrusts that ours gave them. This done, they chained us, after having coarsely ransacked, pursued their point, making a thousand boastings, promising liberty to each who surrendered without combat, after having flown, and finally, laden with merchandise, at the end of seven or eight days, took the road to Barbary, Dan and Hole of Thieves without seeing the Great Turk, were arriving, they exposed us in sail with a verbal process of our capture, they saying to have been made in proper naval espionage, which if it was this year, we would have been delivered by the consul of the king who holds from it to make the trade free to the French. Their procedure of our sale was after they had stripped us completely naked, they gave us each a pair of breeches, a linen tunic, with a bonnet, a piece of bread for the value of three quid, as they were sold for by merchants buying in the fair of Chink, one of the ports of the land, to sell us. They made us be seen five or six times by the chains on the neck. They brought us back to the boat so that the merchants could see who could eat and who could not, to show that the wounds were not mortal. This done, they brought us back to the marketplace where we were visited by all just as one does to buy a horse or an ox, opening our mouths to see if we were sound, making us turn all around, the same as one does to buy a horse. I was sold to a fisherman, who soon made me work for him, and would have soon killed me, had he not been persuaded by a doctor, an old man, a spagyric physician, a sovereign extractor of quintessences, a very humane and tractable man, who, to this philosopher, had worked for years in the search for the philosopher's stone, and had found what he claimed, but secretly taught other sorts of transmutation of metals. In faith of which, I saw him often melt as much gold as silver together, put them into small sheets, and then a bit of some powder, then another crucible, and then hold it over a 24-hour fire, then cover and find the silver turned into gold, and more often still, to congeal quicksilver into fine silver, which he sold to give to the poor. My occupation was to keep the fire for ten or twelve furnaces, in which, thank God, I no longer had any fear but pleasure. He loved me very much and took great pleasure in explaining alchemy to me, more so, he laughed, saying it was easier to attract me with his promising immense riches and all his knowledge. God always operated in my belief of deliverance through the assiduous prayers that I offered him and to the Virgin Mary, through her sole intercession I firmly believe I have been delivered. The hope and firm assurance that I would see you again, sir, made me sit down to beg him to teach me the means of curing the gravel, in which I saw him daily perform miracles. What he did, have me see prepare and administer the ingredients. I lived with this old man from the month of September 1605 until the following August, when I was taken and brought to the great sultan, to work for him, but in vain, because he died of regret for the poor service I could render him. But his nephew, a true anthropomorphite, who reclaimed me soon after his uncle's death, because, as Mr. de Brieve, ambassador for the king in Turkey, could tell, came to buy me with good and express patents from the Grand Sultan, to recover the Christian slaves as an enemy by nature, bought me. A renegade in Nice turned Turk, to recover the Christian slaves as an enemy by nature, bought me and took me to his estate in Savoy. This is what is called the property one holds as a sharecropper of the great lord, for the people own nothing, all belong to the Sultan. The estate of this man was in the mountains, where the country is extremely hot and desert. After converting this man, Vincent left with him, ten months later. Afterward, in about twelve days, continues the writer, we arrived with a small skiff and we rendered the twenty-eighth day of June to Egmort, and then after an Avignon, where the vice-legate received publicly the renegade, tears in the eye and blood at the throat, at the house of Saint-Pierre, the honor of God and edification of the spectators. My lord said, I had the honor and favor to touch and caress, for some secrets of alchemy that I read and took of which he makes much, he said, that if I had as much given to me by God, 
because he has worked all the time of his life, and that he breathes another entirely, Vincent de Paul. In January 1608, a second letter, addressed to Rome to the same addressee, shows Vincent de Paul initiating the vice legate of Avignon, which has just been mentioned, and very much in favor, thanks to his spagyric secrets. My state is such, in a word, that I am in the prime of Rome, at the house of my studies, maintained by Monsignor the vice legate, who was of Avignon, who entreated the honor of loving me and desiring my advancement, for having shown him many beautiful curious things that I learned during my slavery of the old Turkish man to whom I wrote you that I was sold, of the number of which curiosity is the beginning, not the total perfection, to make artificial resurrections to speak a dead tongue, of which miserable one he used to make his god Muhammad listen to his will by that head, and a thousand other beautiful geometric things, which I learned from him, of which that lord is so jealous that he does not want me to even approach anyone, for fear that I teach them, desiring to have only the reputation of knowing these things, which he is pleased to sometimes show to his holiness and the cardinals. Despite the little credence he gives to alchemists and their science, Georges Bois recognizes that one must not suspect the sincerity of the narrator, nor the reality of the experiences this one saw practicing. It is a witness, he writes, who gathers all the guarantees of honesty, and who, furthermore, is not suspected by anyone. We can expect the testimony of an eyewitness, frequent and particularly disinterested, which we do not meet at the same degree among researchers who recount their own experiences and who are always preoccupied with their own particular views. It's a man, he is not particular, he is a good witness, but he is not infallible. He could have been mistaken for gold or for something that was not available at all. It is what we are inclined to believe, according to current ideas and what we are supposed to arrange in the racks of the usual. But, if we hold ourselves to weighing simply the testimony that he gives us, the mistake is not possible. He clearly says that the alchemist makes an alloy containing as much gold as silver, this is therefore a well-defined alloy. The sheets are arranged in layers, separated by some powder, then tis the philosopher's stone, but it possesses one of its properties, the one that transmutes it. It is heated for 24 hours, and the silver is transformed into gold. This gold or is resold without any transformation. Moreover, it is unlikely that the operation is mistaken among the merchants, that such a mistake could be so easily conducted. Because at that time everyone believed in alchemy, goldsmiths, bankers, merchants, all knew very well to distinguish pure gold from gold alloyed with other metals. Since Archimedes, the whole world knows the law by the relationship that exists between its volume and its weight. Princes, counterfeiters do not deceive the banker's balance, nor the art of essays. We did not trade in gold by selling for gold what was not. It was, at the time we place ourselves, in 1605, in Tunis, which was then one of the most known markets of international trade, a fraud as difficult, as perilous as it would be today in, for example, London, Amsterdam, New York or Paris, where they practice tests of the ingots. This is more demonstrative, in our judgment, of the facts that we have just revealed the support of the alchemist's opinion on the reality of transmutation. As for the operation itself, it depends exclusively on the archimy and is very close to what Pantheus teaches in the Voarchdumia and of which he designates the result under the name of gold of two fermentations. Because if Vincent de Paul has well outlined the broad outlines of the operation, it is because, the procedure, if one has kept it secret, on the other hand, to describe the order and the way of operating. He who, nowadays, would attempt to realize it, does he have a perfect knowledge of the special cement, must establish the failure. It is indeed gold that, to acquire the ability to transmute silver, which is its ally, needs first to be prepared, the cement acting only on silver alone. Without this disposition, gold remains inert within the said cement and will not leave it until it has acquired what nature does not give it. The spagyricists name this preliminary work exaltation or transfusion, and it is also by the aid of a cement applied by stratification that one executes it. Hence, the composition of this first cement being different from that of the second, the denomination affected by Pantheus to the metal obtained is thus fully justified. The secret of exaltation, without the knowledge of which one cannot succeed, consists of increasing, either in one go or gradually, the normal color of gold by the sulfur of an imperfect metal, copper ordinarily. This one furnishes to the precious metal its own blood by a sort of chemical transfusion. The gold, overloaded with tincture, then takes on the red hue that can give the specific mercury of silver the appearance of gold if one pushes the tint, by permission of the spirits released from the cement during the work. This transmission of excess sulfur retained by the exalted gold occurs little by little under the action of heat. It requires 24 to 40 hours, depending on the worker's skill and the volume of materials treated. 
it is necessary to pay much attention to the fire regime, which must be continuous and quite strong, without ever reaching the melting point of the alloy. In overheating, one risks volatilizing the gold and dissipating the sulfur introduced into the gold, the sulfur not having yet acquired its perfect fixity. Finally, this same manipulation, deliberately emitted by an enlightened alchemist who has nothing to do with so many opinions, understands the brocading of the extracted sheets, their fusion and their copulation. The gold pellet clearly shows, upon weighing, a more or less noticeable reduction, generally between a fifth and a quarter of the weight of the gold used. Despite the loss, the procedure still leaves a significant remunerator. We will point out, regarding exaltation, that gold coral, obtained by one of the diverse methods recommended, remains capable of transmuting directly, that is without the aid of further fermentation, a certain amount of silver, about the same weight as that of the gold used. The procedure, if one has kept it secret, on the other hand, to describe the order and the way of operating. He who, nowadays, would attempt to realize it, does he have a perfect knowledge of the special cement, must establish the failure. It is indeed gold that, to acquire the ability to transmute silver, which is its ally, needs first to be prepared, the cement acting only on silver alone. Without this disposition, gold remains inert within the said cement and will not leave it until it has acquired what nature does not give it. The spagyricists name this preliminary work exaltation or transfusion, and it is also by the aid of a cement applied by stratification that one executes it. Hence, the composition of this first cement being different from that of the second, the denomination affected by Pantheus to the metal obtained is thus fully justified. However, it is impossible to determine the exact value of the coefficient as it is impossible to determine the exact power of the orification in melting the red gold with an aquafortis, triple weight, aquafortis, and sublimating the laminated alloy at the start of the operation. After this exaltation, based on the absorption of a certain portion of sulfur by the mercury of the gold, we obtain a remarkable increase in the coloration of the metal, a process that some indications on the processes carried out in these designs have. It is said that the solar mercury has the faculty of retaining firmly a fraction of the metallic mercury when acting alone, in order to dissociate the primitive alloy formed. Thus, the gold melted with copper, if it comes to be separated, never leaves entirely a parcel of tincture stolen from it, so much so that in each subsequent action, the gold is enriched more and more and can thus transfer this excess tincture to the metal that is close to it, that is to say, silver. An experienced chemist, as Naxagoras notes, knows well enough, if he purifies the gold up to 24 times to his advantage, by sulfur of antimony, it acquires a unique color, vivid and unequal. But there is a loss of metal, contrary to what happens with copper because, in the purification, the mercury of gold abandons a part of its substance to the antimony, and the sulfur is then unbalanced, by the natural proportions. This is what makes the process unusable and only allows to expect a simple satisfaction of curiosity. We can also exalt gold by melting it first with three times its weight of copper, then decomposing the alloy, this time by lima eel, with boiling aquafortis. Although this technique is laborious and costs a lot, given the volume of acid required, it is however one of the best and most sure that we know. However, if we possess an energetic and acting reducer, knowing how to temper the gold by the fusion of gold and copper, the operation will be greatly simplified and we will not have to fear neither loss of material nor excessive labor despite the indispensable repetitions that this method still demands. Finally, the artist, by studying these diverse ways, will be able to discover the means of working directly on sulfur, to extract it from lead, to incinerate it in a raw state and to project it a little into the melted gold, which will retain the pure part, unless he prefers to recover from all metals the one to which the specific sulfur belongs, which gold manifests the greatest affinity for. But that's enough. Let him who wants to work now, let everyone's opinion, following or not taking advice, matters little. We referred one last time to all the beneficial operations described in these pages, none of which are related, closely or distantly, to traditional alchemy. None can be compared to Chinese Morai which separates the two sciences, an insurmountable obstacle to those who are not familiarized with the methods and chemical formulas. We do not want to despair anyone, but truth compels us to say that they will never come out of the voices of official chemistry, which are turned towards pragmatism. Because to doubt in good faith, to resolutely deviate from the science of official chemistry, when explaining phenomena in a specific way, without using any other technique than that of the learned men on whom their criticism is exercised. There have always been, alas, these wanderers and these deceived, and it is for them no doubt that Jacques Tesson wrote these words full of truth, 
those who want to make our work by digestions, by vulgar distillations and by similar sublimations, and others by triturations, all of these are off the right path, in great error and trouble, and deprived of ever achieving it, because all these names, and words, and ways of operating, are metaphorical names, words and manners. We therefore believe we have fulfilled our design and demonstrated, as far as possible, that the current practice of chemistry is not the old and simple alchemy, but the ancient spagyric, enriched by successive contributions of Greek, Arab, and medieval alchemy. And if one wishes to have some idea of the secret science, let one reflect on the work of the farmer and that of the microbiologist, for ours is dependent on similar conditions. Just as nature gives the farmer the land and the grain, the microbiologist the agar-agar and the spore, so does it provide the alchemist with the proper metallic soil and the suitable seed. If all the circumstances favorable to the regular progress of this cultivation are strictly observed, the harvest cannot fail to be abundant. In summary, the science of alchemy, of extreme simplicity in its materials and in its formula, remains, however, the most thankless, the most obscure of all, considering the exact knowledge of the required influences. This is where its mysterious side lies, and it is towards the solution of this difficult problem that all the efforts of the sons of Hermes converge.